Order. Statement. The Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, with permission, I would like to make a statement on last week's European Council. Before turning to Brexit, let me touch on two significant conclusions from the other business of the Council. First, we expressed our utmost concern over the escalation we have seen at the Kerch Straits and the Sea of Azov and Russia's continued violations of international law. We agreed to roll over economic sanctions against Russia and we stand ready to further strengthen our support, in particular for the affected areas of Ukraine. And second, we also agreed to work together on tackling the spread of deliberate, large-scale and systematic disinformation, including as part of hybrid warfare. On this, I outline some of the world-leading work that the UK is doing in this field. And I was clear that after we have left the European Union, the UK will continue to work closely with our European partners to uphold the international rules-based system and to keep all our people safe. And that is why it is right that our Brexit deal includes the deepest security partnership that has ever been agreed with the EU. Mr Speaker, at this Council I faithfully and firmly reflected the concerns of this House over the Northern Ireland backstop. I explained that the assurances we had already agreed with the EU were insufficient for this House, and we had to go further in showing that we never want to use this backstop, and if it is used, it must be a temporary arrangement. Some of the resulting exchanges at this Council were robust, but I make no apology. I make make no apology for standing up for the interests of this House and the interests and the interests of our whole United Kingdom. In response, the EU27 published a series of conclusions. They made clear that it is there, and I quote, firm determination to work speedily on a subsequent agreement that establishes by the 31st of December 2020 alternative arrangements so that the backstop will not need to be triggered. The House will forgive me, but I think this bears repeating. The backstop will not need to be triggered. They underlined that if the backstop were nevertheless to be triggered, it would apply temporarily. They said that in this event, the EU would use its best endeavours to negotiate and conclude expeditiously a subsequent agreement that would replace the backstop. And they gave a new assurance in relation to the future partnership with the UK to make it even less likely that the backstop would ever be needed by stating that the EU stands ready to embark on preparations immediately after signature of the withdrawal agreement to ensure that negotiations can start as soon as possible after the UK's withdrawal. Mr Speaker, in these conclusions, in their statements at the Council and in their private meetings with me, my fellow EU leaders could not have been clearer. They do not want to use this backstop. They want to agree the best possible future relationship with us. There is no plot to keep us in the backstop. Indeed, President Macron said on Friday, quote, we can clarify and reassure. The backstop is not our objective, it is not a durable solution, and nobody is trying to lock the UK into the backstop. As formal conclusions from a European Council, these commitments have legal status and should be welcomed. They go further than the EU has ever done previously in trying to address the concerns of this House. And of course, they sit on top of the commitments that we have already negotiated in relation to the backstop, including ensuring the customs element is UK wide that both sides are legally committed to using best endeavours to have our new relationship in place before the end of the implementation period, that if the new relationship isn't ready, we can choose to extend the implementation period instead of the backstop coming into force, that if the backstop does come in, we can use alternative arrangements, not just the future relationship to get out of it, that the treaty is clear the backstop can only ever be temporary, and that there is an explicit termination clause. But, Mr Speaker, I know that this House is still deeply uncomfortable about the backstop, and I understand that, and I want to secure to us to go further still in the reassurances we secure. Discussions with my EU partners, including Presidents Tusk, Juncker and others, have shown that further clarification following the Council's conclusions is in fact possible, so discussions are continuing to explore further political and legal assurances. 
and we are also looking closely at new ways of empowering the House of Commons to ensure that any provision for a backstop has democratic legitimacy. This is very irregular. The statement must be heard. There will be a full opportunity for exchanges, but the statement by the Prime Minister must be heard and heard with courtesy. The Prime Minister. For empowering the House of Commons to ensure that any provision for a backstop has democratic legitimacy and to enable the House to place its own obligations on the Government to ensure that the backstop cannot be in place indefinitely. But it is now only just over 14 weeks until the UK leaves the EU. And I know many members... Many members of this House are concerned that we need to take a decision soon. Am I right? My right honourable friend, the Leader of the House, will set out business on Thursday in the usual way. But, But I can confirm today that we intend to return to the meaningful vote debate in the week commencing 7th of January and hold the vote the following week. Mr Speaker... Mr Speaker, when we have the vote, when we have the vote, members will need to reflect carefully on what is in the best interests of our country. I know that there are a range of very strongly held personal views on this issue across the House, and I respect all of them. But expressing our personal views is not what we are here to do. We asked the British people to take this decision. 400, 472 current members of this House voted for the referendum in June 2015, with just 32 voting against. And the British people responded by instructing us to leave the European Union. Similarly, similarly 438 current members of this House voted to trigger Article 50. to set set the process of our departure in motion, with only 85 of today's members voting against. Now, we must honour our duty to finish the job. I I know this is not everyone's perfect deal. It is a compromise. But if we let the perfect be the enemy of the good, then we risk leaving the EU with no deal. Of course, of course, we have prepared for no deal. And tomorrow the Cabinet will be discussing the next phase in ensuring that we are ready for that scenario. But let us not risk the jobs, services and security of the people we serve by turning our backs on an agreement with our neighbours that honours the referendum and provides for a smooth and orderly exit. Avoiding no deal is only possible if we can reach an agreement or if we or, or if we abandon Brexit entirely. And as I said in the debate earlier this month, do not imagine that if we vote this down a different deal is going to miraculously appear. If you want proof, look at the conclusions of this Council. As President Juncker said, it is the best deal possible and the only deal possible. And any, any, proposal, any proposal for the future relationship, whether Norway, Canada or any other variety that has been mentioned, would require agreeing this withdrawal agreement. The Leader of the Opposition, as well as some others, are trying to pretend they could do otherwise. This is a fiction. Finally, let us not break faith with the British people by trying to stage another referendum. Another vote which would do irreparable damage to the integrity of our politics. Because it Order. There are many members of this House, including an illustrious chair of a select committee, who are heckling noisily and abri- Mr. Angus Brendan McNeil, you're a cheeky chappy, but we need much less of the cheek and more by way of courtesy in listening to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister. Thank you. Uh, Another vote which would do irreparable damage to the integrity of our politics because it would say to millions who trusted in democracy that our democracy does not deliver. 
another vote which would likely leave us no further forward than the last, and another vote which would further divide our country at the very moment we should be working to unite it. And let us not, let us not follow the Leader of the Opposition in thinking about what gives him the best chance of forcing a general election. For at this critical moment, at this critical moment in our history, we should be thinking not about our party's interests, but about the national interests. Let us, let us find a way to come together and work together in the national interest to see this Brexit through. Mr Speaker, I will work tirelessly over these next few weeks to fulfil my responsibility as Prime Minister to find a way forwards. Over the last two weeks, I have met quite a number of colleagues, and I am happy to continue to do so on this important issue, so we can fulfil our responsibilities to the British people, so together we can take back control of our borders, laws and money. protecting the jobs, the security and the integrity of our precious United Kingdom. So together we can move on to finalising the future relationship with the European Union and the trade deals with the rest of the world that can fuel our prosperity for years to come. And so together we can get this Brexit done and shift the national focus to our domestic priorities, investing in our NHS, our schools and housing, tackling the injustices that so many still face, and building a country that truly works for everyone. For these are the ways, these are the ways in which together this House will best serve the interests of the British people, and I commend this statement to the House. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the Prime Minister for an advanced copy of her statement. On Ukraine, as NATO has said, we need both sides to show restraint and de-escalate with international law adhered to, including Russia allowing unhindered access to Ukraine's ports on the Sea of Azov. Mr Speaker, we face an unprecedented situation. The Prime Minister has led us into a national crisis. And if any more evidence was needed of why we face this grave situation, the Prime Minister demonstrated it last week's summit. There were some warm words drafted, and the Prime Minister even managed to negotiate those away to be replaced by words about preparing for no deal. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister boasted, I had a robust discussion with President Juncker. But that cannot hide the cold reality that she achieved nothing. Standing at the dispatch box last week, the Prime Minister said, I have made some progress. Mr Speaker, she has not made any progress at all. The Prime Minister said so herself while still in Brussels, and I quote, The EU is clear, as am I, that this is the deal. The European Commission has been categorical. It will not be renegotiated. The EU Council has given the clarification that were possible at this stage, so no further meetings with the UK are foreseen. The deal is unchanged and not going to change. The House must get on with the vote and move on to consider the realistic alternatives. There can be... There can be no logical reason for this delay, except that, in taking shambolic government to a new level, the Prime Minister no longer has the backing of her Cabinet. The International Trade Secretary suggested that the Prime Minister's deal no longer has the backing of the Cabinet. It's worth quoting his words. And I quote, I think that it is very difficult to support the deal if we don't get changes to the backstop. I don't think it will get through. I'm not even sure if the Cabinet will agree for it to be put to the House of Commons. Yeah, well, we've seen that. So we had the spectacle of the last few days with numerous Cabinet members coming forward with their own alternatives. The International Trade Secretary suggested that a two-year transition is to no deal is an option. The Work and Pension Secretary says the Government needs to try something different and build a consensus in Parliament. 
The Attorney General is reported as saying he wants her gone and for the deal to be renegotiated, while the International Development Secretary is allegedly liaising with the ERG to launch an alternative option. Others are reportedly working on a second referendum. But even if Cabinet no longer backs the deal, then who knows what the options would be? So can the Prime Minister answer this? One, does her deal still have the confidence of the Cabinet? Two, is Cabinet collective responsibility still in operation? Three, does it remain government policy to avoid a no-deal outcome? <laughs> Mr Speaker, an unacceptable deal is on the table. No amendment has been secured, renegotiations have been rebuffed, and not even mere assurances have been offered. And the Prime Minister's shoddy deal no longer even has the backing of the Cabinet. The Prime Minister ran away from putting her deal before Parliament because even her own Cabinet has doubts, and she herself admits Parliament won't back it. So we're left edging ever closer to the 29th of March deadline without a deal and without even an agreed plan in Cabinet to get a deal. The Prime Minister has cynically run down the clock trying to manoeuvre Parliament into a choice between two unacceptable outcomes, her deal or no deal. The country, workers and businesses are increasingly anxious. Even yesterday the CBI said uncertainty is throttling firms and threatening jobs, not in the future but right now. The British Chamber of Commerce has said there is no time to waste. A responsible Prime Minister would, for the good of this country, have put this deal before the House this week. This week, so we could move on from this Government's disastrous negotiations. This, Mr Speaker, is a constitutional crisis, and the Prime Minister is the architect of it. She's leading the most shambolic and chaotic Government in modern British history. Even Cabinet no longer functions. A Prime Minister whose authority has been lost, a Cabinet, a cabinet disintegrating into cliques and factions, and a Conservative Party so fundamentally split that its very existence is being discussed. It is clear, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister has failed to renegotiate her deal failed to get any meaningful reassurances. There is no excuse for any more dither or delay. This government, this government, Mr Speaker, has already become the first government in British history to be held in contempt by Parliament. The debate on the meaningful vote was pulled at the last minute, and the Prime Minister has now wasted five weeks having achieved nothing. Not a single word renegotiated, not a single reassurance gained. This last week has embodied the failure, chaos and indecision at the heart of this Government's shambolic handling of Brexit. Today, they have been dragged kicking and screaming to announce a date to restart the debate. But, Mr Speaker, it is... Mr. Uh, Mr Ellis, you are a distinguished ornament of a government department, a representative of the executive branch. Be good, man. You can do so much better when you try. Mr Jeremy Corbyn. But, Mr Speaker, it is disgraceful that a month has been wasted since we were due to vote on the 11th of December. There can be no further attempts to dodge the accountability of government to this Parliament, Mr Speaker. Thank you. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman asked me three questions uh, during that uh, uh, response. 
Does the deal still have the confidence of the Cabinet? Yes. Does Cabinet collective responsibility still apply? Yes. Does, does the Cabinet want to avoid no deal? Yes, the Cabinet wants to ensure that we leave the European Union with a good deal, and that is this deal. The real indecision is the indecision at the heart of a Labour Party that has no plan and no alternative. And the, nas- the national crisis is an opposition that is irresponsible, that puts its party interests first before the interests of the British people. Mitchell. <laughs> uh, it is clear, uh, Mr. Speaker, is it not, that the deal which my right honourable friend has so assiduously negotiated is most unlikely to secure the support of this House of Commons. In these circumstances, does she not think it would be wiser to seek an extension to Article 50? <laughs> I'm not having the right order. I'm not having the right honourable gentleman shout it down. I very gently say to a government whip, don't stand near the chair and shout at your colleagues. If you're going to do that, leave the chamber. We'll manage perfectly adequately without you. Mr Andrew Mitchell. Uh, to, seek, to seek an extension to Article 50 rather than to leave with no deal. Can I say to my right honourable friend that I don't think it's right to be seeking that extension of, of Article 50. I think what, we are fa- what Parliament will be faced with is a decision to exercise its responsibility to deliver on the referendum vote, to deliver Brexit. I continue to believe that this is a good deal. Yes, we are seeking those further reassurances, but I continue to believe that we can leave with a good deal and that this is it. Ms Ian Blackford. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the Prime Minister for advance sight of her statement, but I have to ask, where is the leadership? The phrase which is often used, we thought the Prime Minister had reached rock bottom, but she's still digging. Mr Speaker, we have four sitting days left in this place before the Christmas recess. We are then left with a narrow window when we return in January to find a way forward out of the Government's Brexit timetable. It cannot be done. After two years of negotiation, the Prime Minister has designed a deal that she knows that she cannot deliver. Yeah. It does not have the support of this House. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, it is time to call time on this Government. Yeah. It is a laughing stock. Companies and their workers do not know if we are going to be crashing out of the European Union in three months' time. We have just over 100 days, 100 days to prepare for the risk of a no deal that most sensible folk would reject as being unacceptable. The Prime Minister is playing a game of brinksmanship. The European Council President Donald Tusk was clear when he said, I have no mandate to organise any further negotiations. What more does the Prime Minister need to hear to know that her deal is dead? This is embarrassing. The Prime Minister (laughs) might be prepared to be embarrassed by the shambles but the rest of us are not. Parliament needs to take control of this situation and seek to find a solution yeah, yeah. that prevents a risk to jobs and prosperity. It's the people of our countries that we are talking about. Yeah. Today, Prime Minister tells us that there are no other options. That is not the case. Standing before Parliament ruling out another referendum on EU membership is an act of desperation from the Prime Minister. Yeah, here, here. Knowing that she cannot get her own deal through this place, The Prime Minister wants to silence debate. Having taken away Parliament's voice, our rights to a meaningful vote, now the Prime Minister wants us to take the right of the people to vote away. Their democratic right to have their say. Their democratic right to change their mind. Mr Speaker, I plead to the Prime Minister to put all options back on the table. Stop operating in isolation. Reach out and speak with the opposition parties. We all have a responsibility to protect our citizens. It is time, Prime Minister, to move beyond narrow party politics at this place. It is time to operate in the interests of all our nations. I ask the Prime Minister to bring forward the meaningful vote on her deal before the Christmas recess. There 
is no reason to delay. Let us have that meaningful vote this week. And lastly, will she do the right thing and meet with me and other opposition party leaders this week collectively? This, Mr Speaker, is the true test of this Government's word. If we are to believe that we are a partnership of equals, then now today we must be heard. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'm happy to say to the right honourable gentleman, if he wants to come to talk to me about this issue, I'm happy to talk to him about it. But we do have a fundamental difference of opinion that was revealed in the response of his party uh, to what I said in my statement. I believe we should deliver leaving the EU for the British people. He believes we should stay in the EU. So that's a fundamental difference that we have uh, there. Uh, he talks about putting jobs and prosperity first. This deal does just that, but it delivers on the referendum while protecting jobs and prosperity. He says he doesn't want to leave with no deal. Well, the only way to ensure that you leave, with, uh, leave without uh, uh, having no deal is to support a deal. And can I just, uh, can I just remind the right hon. Gentleman gently that 56% of Scots voted for pro-Brexit parties. Ah, Dame Cheryl Gillan. The Independent Commission on Referendums published earlier this year and recommended that any second referendum on a subject should be specified in the legislation enabling the first referendum so that the requirement for or possibility of a second referendum and the reason for it is clear to the electorate before the first vote takes place. Would the Prime Minister agree that no such provision was made and that calling for a second referendum at this stage is merely a ruse to try and reverse the result yeah. and is not yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Can I say to my right honourable friend um, that I'm grateful to her for pointing that out to the, uh, to the House. Of course, it is absolutely the case that there was no suggestion when the referendum was put to the people in 2016 that there might be a second referendum. People were told, they were led to believe that at their vote would be delivered by the government of the, uh, of the time subsequently, and that's what I believe it is certainly in our interest as a government to do, to deliver on that vote and leave the European Union. Sir Vincent Cable. Uh, the Prime Minister may be aware that the, the, the bookmakers has been offering 66 to 1 against her uh, deal passing Parliament, but even money on a referendum and even money on her then winning it. Could it be that the Cabinet Ministers who were known for preparing for a referendum are not being disloyal to her but simply better at maths? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, sure, I'm not sure the right honourable gentleman should uh, spend too much time in the betting shops. I'm not sure the odds on the Liberal Democrats are very good at all. Yeah. Sir William Cash. Uh, thank, thank, you, thank you, Mr Speaker. Will, will the Prime Minister confirm, despite the European Council's own so-called legal endorsement of the withdrawal agreement, which they state is not open for renegotiation, that as respects the UK itself, this agreement has not been initialed or signed by herself as Prime Minister and is only a draft, being no more than a political agreement under which nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, including the backstop, and therefore she can still walk away. I'm, I can certainly confirm to my honourable friend that obviously this is a deal that has been negotiated between the UK and the European Union, but it does have to go through certain processes in order to be ratified. Part of that is ratification here in the uh, United Kingdom Parliament, and part is ratification in the European, Union, uh, European Parliament. And of course, it is those processes that lead to the final agreement and the withdrawal agreement. Mr. Nigel Dodds. I'm sure the Prime Minister will agree that EU Council conclusions and declarations are, of course, political statements, and they have talked about clarifications, reassurances, but ruled out renegotiating, contradicting, or reopening the legal text. Indeed, they even struck out language saying that the backstop did not represent a desirable outcome for the EU 27. So, will the Prime Minister today Tell us exactly and precisely what she is actually asking for to deliver on the key concerns about the legally binding indefinite nature of the backstop 
with no right for this country to exit it on its own terms. Yes, what what I am asking for is to ensure that we can deal with the concerns that the Right Honourable Gentleman and other members of this House have expressed about the issue of whether the backstop will could be indefinite or would be indefinite. So there are two ways to deal with that. The first is to ensure that all arrangements are brought in place to ensure the backstop is not triggered in the first place. And the second is to ensure that if it is triggered, then it is only temporary. And it is further assurances, as I said in my statement, political and legal assurances in relation to those issues, which can be achieved in a number of ways, but it's further political and legal assurances in relation to those issues that I'm seeking. Justine Greening. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As others have said, on Thursday it will be 100 days until Britain leaves the European Union. At the moment we have no deal and no plan B. This is a constitutional crisis because this House is not being allowed to express its will on behalf of our communities who around the country are telling us that they reject this deal. That is why MPs want to be able to vote against it. So can I say to the Prime Minister that it's no it's pointless criticizing other members in this House who are coming up with other solutions, whether a second referendum, whether Canada, whether Norway. We are as a Parliament trying to find a solution through the political cul-de-sac and mess that we now find this country in. It was clear back in the summer that the Prime Minister's deal was not going to succeed. She now isn't just listening, she's not allowing debate. This is totally unacceptable. Will she agree to bring her vote before this House, before Christmas, so that she can reflect on the outcome over the Christmas break and then leave us? I say to my right honourable friend, and I know that she and I, I think, have a difference of opinion in relation to the issue of a second referendum, but can I say to my right honourable friend that, of course, I have indicated when the vote will be brought back to the House. There will be necessary for the usual channels to agree what the business motion would be and how many many days of debate would be available for that. We are not trying to stop debate. What I am trying to do... What I, am, what I am doing is recognising and reflecting to the European Union the concerns expressed here in this House and seeking ways in which we can ensure that members of this House have sufficient confidence that those particular concerns have been addressed. Mr Hilary Benn. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister went to the European Council seeking legal assurances and returned with none. And the next council meeting scheduled is in the third week of March. Now that cabinet ministers are openly speculating about what should happen when her deal is defeated, can she tell the House what purpose it serves to continue to pretend that we might leave the European Union without an agreement when she knows better than anyone else how damaging and disastrous it would be, and when she told the House just now that it would risk the jobs, services and security of the people. I say to the right honourable gentleman that I have responded on this point previously. Uh, we do have, this House has a responsibility, and uh, it will have a responsibility, to come to a decision on this matter and to determine whether to leave the European Union with a deal uh, or, what, uh, or to leave without a deal. Uh, or there will be those in this House who will try to ensure that actually we stay in the European Union. I think that would be wrong. I think we should be leaving the European Union because that's what people voted for in the biggest exercise of democracy in our history. And I believe that we should be leaving with a good deal, and this is it. Mr. Dominic Robb. The final steps of contingency planning for departure on WTO terms are essential in case EU intransigence continues. Can the Prime Minister confirm that all of those necessary actions are now being taken to see us through any short-term disruption, including action to prepare for extra checks at the border, diversion of flow to friendlier ports, liberalisation of tariff schedules and cutting taxes for businesses? 
to my right honourable friend. He's, temp- he's trying to tempt me into uh, some budgetary d- uh, 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 decisions there, which, uh, as he will know, uh, would not be appropriate at this uh, dispatch box. But what I would say to him is that we are making the plans for uh, the contingency arrangements for no deal. As I said in my statement, the Cabinet will be meeting tomorrow to discuss what further steps need to be taken. Uh, We have already stepped up those preparations, as my right honourable friend uh, indeed uh, was responsible for himself when he was the Brexit Secretary of State. Uh, But further stepping up of those no deal preparations has gone on to address exactly the sorts of issues that he's looking at, such as the flow of traffic into different ports here in the UK to ease the disruption. Disruption will take place in no deal in the short term. We want to take every step that we can to mitigate that. The The Prime Minister ruled out a customs union. The Prime Minister ruled out Norway, ruled out Canada, ruled out parliamentary votes on her objectives, ruled out parliamentary votes on the options, is ruling out now extending Article 50. And yet everyone knows she does not have support for her plan and she has no assurances from the EU that she asked for. If she carries on like this, she's the one that will take us over a no deal. This Christmas, businesses and departments across the country are going to be spending billions of pounds now preparing for no deal. Doesn't she have a duty and a responsibility to them to rule out no deal, to say she will extend Article 50 and have a proper discussion in Parliament to work out the way forward? to the right honourable lady. First of all, she says that we ruled out certain things. Actually, the British people, uh, in the vote that took place in 2016, the majority voted to leave the European Union, and one of the key issues in that was bringing an end to free movement, which some of those uh, uh, suggestions that she has as alternatives would not allow to happen. So actually, we're trying to reflect the views that took place during that vote. And the decision, the decision... The decision as to whether we go forward with the deal or not will be one that this Parliament will take. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. While my right honourable friend continues to negotiate changes to the backstop, would she agree with me that if those efforts were unfortunately to fail, and if we are to avoid leaving without a deal which we must at all costs avoid? It must now be critical, will she not agree, that we build a consensus in this House and forge a compromise that delivers Brexit whilst protecting British jobs and interests. Well, I I agree with my right honourable friend that the aim of everything that we are doing and the aim of what this House will do, I believe, should be to ensure that we deliver on that vote and do it in a way that protects jobs and prosperity for people up and down this country. That's exactly what we're working for, and I hope that every member of this House will consider that when it comes to looking at uh, whether or not we should support this deal. I believe we should, because it does exactly what my right honourable friend has suggested. Ms Kendall... Let me tell the Prime Minister what is irresponsible. Delaying a vote on her agreement, not because she's going to get any changes to it, but because she wants to run down the clock and try and intimidate MPs into supporting it to avoid no deal. And isn't the reality that this isn't acting in the national interest, but in her personal interest. And neither her party nor the country will forgive her for it. Can I say to the the Honourable Lady that uh, what I believe would not have been right would be for me not to have listened to the concerns that were expressed in this House. I did listen to those concerns, and I am working and discussions are continuing with the European Union in relation to how we address those uh, concerns, and then it will be for Parliament to decide. But that will be, at that point, Parliament, members of this House, will have a responsibility to determine whether or not the decision that they come to will be about whether or not to deliver on the vote of the referendum in a way that uh, protects jobs and our security. Sir Michael Fallon. Given that the Prime Minister has listened and is still trying to improve the deal, would that deal not be more palatable if the timetable for starting on and agreeing the terms of future trade was as firm and as legally binding as the timetable for paying over all the billions? Mm. 
my, my right honourable friend makes a, a very important point. We have achieved, uh, obviously, from the Council conclusions, there has been some further progress in relation to the EU's commitment to the, uh, starting the next stage of negotiations. But my honourable friend has raised an issue which is exactly one which I think it is important for us to continue to discuss with them about getting that absolute confirmation and certainty. Uh, he refers to legal certainty as to when those negotiations can start and uh, when it is the determination of both parties to ensure those negotiations end. We want that trade deal in place, and I want it in place by the end of December 2020. Neil Gray. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. She has said for two years that no deal is better than a bad deal. Of course, now we know why. We know why. Her deal is a disaster and will never pass this House. So as she desperately tries to let the clock till tick down, will she publish her no deal planning? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I have been clear and I remain clear that no deal is better than a bad deal, but I believe this is a good deal. John Redwood. Will she now publish the tariff schedule for the UK for a WTO exit? Will that include zero tariffs on all components coming in for manufacture here to provide yet another great boost to Britain as a big manufacturing centre? Obviously, I say, I say to my right honourable friend that these issues are ones that would have to be addressed in relation to a no-deal uh, no scenario. Uh, we are continuing to discuss, as a government, the plans that we need to put in place to deal with the possibility of a no-deal in order to mitigate the disruption that uh, would occur in a no-deal situation. Uh, and uh, obviously, we will be looking closely at the tariff schedules. Ben Bradshaw. How much would it cost the NHS, our other public services and thousands of businesses up and down this country as they are forced to activate their no-deal contingency plans because of her reckless time-wasting? Can I say to the, the right honourable gentleman, responsible government is about ensuring that contingency arrangements are put in place. That is the responsible thing which, which any government in this situation would do to ensure that those contingency arrangements are in place until we have the outcome and know with certainty what is happening on the 20, you know, whether we're leaving with the deal or with no deal. We need to make those contingency arrangements. That's the right thing to do. Esther McVeigh. After tomorrow's Cabinet meeting, where no deal preparations will be high on the agenda, will the Prime Minister please arrange for a Minister to come to this House to give a statement uh, this week and then every week until we leave the EU so that we know what's happening, so the country can be reassured business and individuals? That is vital. They are happening. And this House needs to know what is happening. I, I think, can I say to my right honourable friend that obviously she is raising the important point of information being available to this House and to members of this House on the uh, planning that is taking place. Uh, of course, there are a number of ways in which that is expressed to the House. Uh, the uh, Secretary of State for exiting the European Union appears before the Select Committee uh, and responds to uh, issues on that. And of course, these are matters um, which have been addressed in debates with, uh, within this House, but I understand the point she's making about wanting to ensure that members of this House are aware of the arrangements that are being put in place. Frank Field. Does the Prime Minister accept? Well, this House doesn't need more time to debate, but to vote yes. yeah. on the various options before it. Might she not therefore agree that we vote as soon as possible on the amendments the Speaker will choose? of those tabled, and if she's unwilling to do that, might the opposition parties think how they can use their time they have to debate on the floor of the House to actually make that, bring forward that vote, and if members actually agree with this line of action, might they sign the motion that's on the order paper in my name? I thank the right honourable gentleman for his, uh, for his question. Obviously, the intention is to have a proper number of days for debate when the vote is brought back in, uh, in January. At that stage, at that stage, of course, uh, how the matter is put before the House will depend on the further discussions that have taken place with the European Union. And uh, as we've always said, any, any uh, motion on this issue is, of course, uh, amendable by members of the, of the House. Sir Patrick McLaughlin. 
We're told the United Kingdom doesn't want the backstop. We're told the European Union doesn't want to enter the backstop. What on earth is stopping the European Union giving us a legal guarantee that such a backstop would only last for a very short time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I say to my right honourable friend, it is exactly, it is exactly that further legal, further political and legal assurance that we're looking at in relation to this. There have been very clear statements from the European Union in relation to this. Those have been reiterated uh, after the, not only in the Council conclusions, but after the Council conclusions as well. Uh, the best way to stop the backstop coming into place, of course, is to have a firm date for introducing the uh, future relationship. Uh, that is currently uh, the intention. Is that is currently 31st of December 2020, and will be continuing. Continu Continuing to discuss what further assurances we can get on this point. Mr. Chris Leslie. When precisely will the Prime Minister be securing this miracle on 34th Street uh, uh, guarantee from the European Union uh, that she's going to come back with on the backstop um, before the 7th of January? If she does come back with that, will the House be debating it on a fresh government motion? And in terms of her commitment uh, to come back on the 7th of January to start the debate, is that a promise? Say to the right honourable gentleman, first of all, the nature, the business motion will, of course, and the nature and way in which the debate is to be uh, dealt with by this House will, of course, be discussed with the usual, through the usual channels. I said we would be starting that debate in, the, in that first week with a vote in the following week. Uh, the uh, right honourable gentleman asked me about the timetable. Discussions are continuing with the European Union, and I expect those to continue into the new year. Now, Dr. Sarah Wollaston. Speaker, here's what would do irreparable damage to the integrity of our politics, and that is to run down the clock um, and to end up forcing through a deal uh, which 48% didn't want because they didn't want to leave the European Union, but also the majority of those who voted for Brexit don't want. Yes. The mathematics of this just simply don't stack up. The majority in this House and in the wider country doesn't want this deal. Um, so can I ask the Prime Minister to get on with it so that we can actually vote on this and then look at practical alternatives? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I say to my honourable friend that, uh, as I have indicated in my statement, we will bring that vote back in uh, the second week in January. The debate, the debate, uh, it's our intention that the debate will start in the previous week, in the first week, of, uh, first week of January. I think it is important, as I said earlier, that I have listened to the House. I suspect, honourable members, had I not uh, listened to the House and been starting the work to try and get those further assurances from members of this House, uh, then that would have been an issue that people would have raised. I think it's right that I, I and the Government are doing exactly uh, what we uh, said we would, which is working with the EU for those further political and legal assurances. And Pat McFadden. Mr Speaker, we now know what the plan is. Having failed to win support for the deal in Parliament and having failed to get any meaningful change to it, at the European Council last week. The Prime Minister now simply wants to run down the clock and yeah. intimidate Parliament Absolutely into right. choosing yeah. between a bad deal and the disaster of no deal. Absolutely. I put it to the Prime Minister that it is wrong to threaten and intimidate Parliament Absolutely. in this way. Yeah. But more importantly, it is reckless to take options off the table, as she has tried to do today, that could prevent the disaster of no deal for the country. Yeah. 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 To the right hon. Right gentleman, whatever the point at which this House faced the meaningful vote, it will be a decision for members of this House as to whether to accept the deal or to whether to, you know, there are some who would prefer to see uh, uh, action taken so that we don't leave the European Union. I think that would be wrong. I think it would be right. I, what I believe is right is that we deliver on the referendum, and the question will be for members of this House as to whether they accept that responsibility to come to a decision. At the moment, there have been lots of ideas around this House about what should happen. No alternatives that are no alternatives that actually deliver on the referendum, that deliver on the referendum in a way that protects jobs. That's what the deal does. But it will be a decision for individual members of this House to bear the responsibility that they have. Mr. Oliver Heald. The uh, Prime Minister will be aware that those of us who have large manufacturing companies in our constituencies, so in my case Johnson, Matthew and Royston, 
who do integrated manufacture on a European basis with short supply lines are getting on to people like me saying, look, it's very urgent that we have a deal. Now, when she's negotiating and discussing in Europe with people like Mr Juncker, does she have uh, the feeling that there is that urgent uh, need to get a deal and that they are prepared to listen to what she says and really put in a shift? Because I must say that when I saw him looking so relaxed and really being rather patronising to our Prime Minister, uh, I felt that wasn't really putting in the sort of shift that she has. Can I, can I say to my right hon. Friend that indeed the I think, very clear message that comes back from the European Union, from the Commission and EU leaders, is that they do want uh, a deal. We have obviously negotiated this deal. There are those further assurances I'm uh, working to achieve. And uh, it has been made clear by President Juncker and others um, that those further discussions can indeed take place. Liz Savile Roberts. Yeah. Yeah. The Prime Minister knows that no better deal will be found in Europe and that no majority will be found in Westminster. She also knows no deal is disastrous. She delayed a vote because she knew her deal would fail to get the support it needed. She can employ the same logic again. Will she confirm that she holds the power to seek an extension for Article 50? It is, of course, it is, of course, uh, well, first of all, the government does not, the government holds the power to seek an extension for Article 50. Any extension of Article 50 would have to be agreed with the European (laughs) Union. Uh, But I I have been clear, I I have been clear that what I believe is the right course of action, having triggered Article 50, having uh, undertaken the negotiations, is that we ensure we leave the European Union on the timetable that we've already set out. Nicky Morgan. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister in her statement talked about empowering this House, but the trouble is is that she is asking this House to accept a deferral for several weeks of the meaningful vote on the draft withdrawal agreement on the basis that further assurances can be agreed with the European Union. But there is nothing in what she has said today or what has been reported in the EU Council that those further assurances are likely to be given. And I say this as somebody who was going to vote for her draft agreement on the basis that she has set out that businesses need certainty and the country needs reassurance. I honestly do not think that businesses and employers and our constituents will understand why this House is going on holiday for two weeks when we should be having the meaningful vote this week. I say to my right hon. Friend, I believe it is, what I believe is right is that what the Government is doing is, having heard the concerns that are expre- have been expressed by members of this House, what, what the Government is doing is taking those concerns to the European Union. Yes, we have uh, the further statements from the EU with legal status uh, in the Council conclusions than we have had before, but we are seeking yet more and further assurances from the European Union. I think that is the right to do- thing to do. Then that can be debated properly by this, uh, by this House and the vote taken. Joanna Cherry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last Thursday, the Attorney General told the House that he was reviewing the question of whether Article 50 could be revoked by a simple vote of this House or by legislation. This Thursday, the Scottish case has been referred back from the Court of Justice to the Court in Edinburgh to look at this issue. Can the Prime Minister confirm for us that the Government's position on how Article 50 could be revoked, whether legislation or simply a vote of this House is required, will be set out to the Court on Edinburgh on Thursday? Can I say to the Honourable Lady that I will certainly look into that issue and uh, get back to her on the specifics of that issue in terms of the stance that the Government is taking in relation to the case that is going to the Court in Edinburgh. As, but I, uh, I know that the Honourable Lady has had considerable interest in the revocation of Article 50. I would simply remind all members of this House that the revocation of Article 50 is something that this Government has said we will not do because revo- revoking Article 50 means staying in the European Union. Jonathan Ginogli. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I was one of the members who would and will support uh, the Prime Minister's deal. But I have to say, Prime Minister, that what's coming back to me from business, um, from industry, from the city, is that we are now hemorrhaging support 
uh, uh, and investment on a yes. daily basis, yes. and it's getting worse. Yes. Which is why I add to other honourable members in saying, please do think again in holding this vote, yes. in holding a series of standalone resolutions, which mean that we can take a view and move on. Here, here. Can I, can I say to my uh, honourable fellow, I, I understand the concern that he's expressing in relation to business. Business wants uh, certainty. Business wants the deal. Business welcomed the deal when we uh, when we uh, negotiated the deal, uh, and uh, I think they are still taking that uh, they're taking that approach. Um, he referred to a. What have uh, I think been referred to as indicative votes? A number of motions that could be brought before this House. There are no plans for indicative votes. Uh, uh, I have no plans for indicative votes. But can I just say to uh, can I just say to my honourable friend and to other members of this House that actually what is necessary is for the House to reflect on what members want in terms of their responsibility. In terms of their responsibility. To, in terms of their responsibility to come to a decision on this matter. And at the moment, there are, as I indicated earlier, a number of views around this House. Some want to stay in the EU, some want to go for a second referendum, some, some would support a no deal, some would support uh, uh, looking at other arrangements. All of those arrangements, any of those arrangements, as I said, uh, that would, relate, would require a withdrawal agreement, because they would, would require us to make clear the basis on which we are withdrawing from the European Union. Angela Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister last week admonished Jean Claude Juncker for his use of the word nebulous. But there are many people in this House who would take issue with her use of the word meaningful, because there's nothing meaningful about a vote which forces members of this House to choose between her deal and no deal. Yeah, so, yeah. when is the Prime Minister going to stop digging, start listening, and building a consensus with members across the House to get us out of this mess? Yeah. Yeah. Can I say to the Honourable Lady that it was always going to be the case, whenever the vote came before this House, that people would have, members of the House would have a decision as to whether to support the deal that had been negotiated with the European Union or not, with the consequences that failure to support that deal would bring. Uh, and that is, is the same whenever that vote is uh, taken. And Dr Julian Lewis. Does the Prime Minister recall telling the House on the 3rd of December that the three to four billion pounds set aside in the budget for contingency no deal planning was about to be allocated in the next few days to relevant departments? Has that allocation been made and is the money now available for essential contingency yeah, planning? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yes, I do recall uh, saying that. I say to my honourable friend that, of course, the 1819 financial year uh, allocations are in place and uh, money is being spent. What we, I think he was referring to and I was referring to was the 1920 allocations. Negotiations on those are well advanced. A number of departments have settled, and we expect to be in a position to confirm all of those shortly. George Half. Last. Friday, a constituent said to me that although she had voted to leave in the referendum in 2016, she now wanted to register the fact that she would now changed her mind, as she put it, for the sake of her grandchildren. If it emerges that a significant number of people who are previous leave voters have reached the same conclusion, which would be more democratic? Allowing them the opportunity to change their mind or press it on regardless. Yeah. Yeah. Right, honourable gentlemen. Um, and I, I also hear from people who are uh, in the opposite position. They voted to remain and now say they would vote to leave the European Union. The, 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 the fact is, the simple fact is, that if there were a second referendum, which, if there were a second referendum which came out with the same result, would those honourable members who wish uh, people to be given the chance to think again continue to say that there should be a referendum? If it came out with a different result, I think there would be many people who would say, actually, how many referendums should we have? How many referendums should we have? This is, this is, we had the referendum, and I believe it's our duty to deliver on it. Anna Seabury. The problem is, Mr Speaker, there is a consensus in the country and that consensus is, is that this is one holy, unholy mess and a solution has to be found. And the Prime Minister still hasn't told her, us what her plan B is. Does she not understand that if we leave the European Union not having a people's vote, 
knowing what Brexit looks like, and then it turns out that the people of this country, knowing what Brexit looked like, didn't want us to leave the European Union, it would be the biggest betrayal of democracy in this country. And the people of this country, especially the young people, would never forget nor forgive us, especially this party. Can I say, my honour, right honourable friend, I know she has taken a particular view in relation to this issue. But I continue to believe that what we should be doing is delivering on the vote. It was overwhelming, as I indicated in the figures that I said in my, set out in my statement. It was the overwhelming view of this Parliament that people should have a vote in the referendum. It was the overwhelming view of this Parliament that Article 50 should be triggered. Article 50 leads to leaving the European Union. It is now our duty to deliver that. Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. How does the Prime Minister have the gall to accuse those of us who want more democracy of breaking faith with the public when she herself has turned faith breaking into a new art form? She has promised no general election last year and then she granted one. She promised, no, she promised a meaningful vote last week and then cancelled it. But you cannot break faith with the British public by asking for their views. Why can she not understand that a people's vote would be the first opportunity for people to vote on the facts, not on the fantasy and the fabrication? Can I just say to the Honourable Lady that there are many people up and down this country 17.4 million people, I think, up and down this country who would say that if the, the vote that took place in 2016 was not honoured by this Parliament, that would be breaking faith. Uh, Sir Peter Bottom Louis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The outcome, as our honourable friend has said, is either we leave without having an agreement to leave and transition and future arrangements, or we go somehow back to having an attempt by some to reverse the result of the referendum or we have to deal with the agreements which are being negotiated now. It is quite clear from Freddie Sayre's article in The Times on Thursday saying that seven people out of eight in the country, and I suspect here as well, would prefer to have the, have the deal with the agreements in preference either to dropping out without a deal or going back to have another referendum. So I can say to the Prime Minister, I think most people support her and we should too. Right, can I thank my right hon. Friend, and that actually reflects that actually reflects the comments that I am given uh, up and uh, around the country when people say to me and write to me and indicate they want us to get on with it, to deliver, and then enable us as a government, as a parliament, to get on with addressing the domestic issues that matter to them day to day. Chukaramuna. Mr Speaker, let us be clear. It is the long list of broken promises of Leave campaigners she appointed to her government which has done irreparable damage to the integrity of our politics. Now, she has been here given three statements, and on each occasion this House is clear it will not vote for her plan, but she continues to refuse to listen. Can I ask her a very specific question? If we get to the March EU Council and there is no consensus in this House on a route forward, Will she now commit, and she said no deal is not something she would countenance, will she now commit at that March 2019 Council to request an extension to Article 50 to stop no deal from happening? I have indicated my uh, approach in relation to the extension of Article 50. Three hands. What Emmanuel Macron said on Friday, uh, recent comments from the Commission uh, have been rather more hostile and anything but nebulous. Uh, Martin Zellmeyer is reported to have told officials, quote, losing Northern Ireland is the price of Brexit. Uh, Sabine Veil has briefed EU ambassadors on the, on the, uh, on the deal that uh, the UK must align their rules, but the EU will retain all the controls. And at the weekend, a further EU official has reported in The Times to have said, to use a Christmas theme, we want all parties and factions in the British Parliament to feel the bleak midwinter. Does this sound, to my right honourable friend, like people negotiating in good faith? Yeah. Yeah. Well, can I say to my right honourable friend, I have always been uh, clear throughout this that these have been tough negotiations, that we, that we have held our side and got, uh, achieved a deal that actually delivers on the vote of the British people, delivers it in a way that protects jobs and security, and I believe protects our prosperity for the future. 
Stephen Doughty. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Is it not the truth that well, the Prime Minister talks about democracy? She prevented the Cabinet having a vote, she's preventing Parliament having a vote, and she doesn't want the public to have a vote on this deal. So if she wants to talk about democracy, um, she should think very, very carefully about that. But will she not admit that she is acting now in a completely reckless fashion with jobs, with business, with investment, and with our constituents' futures? Because on the 2nd of January, when the vast majority of people in this country will go back to work, this Parliament will not be sitting. The Government will still be stalling for time, trying to come up with a magic solution, and people will simply be asking, what is going on? He, uh, I have to say, he asked me a question in relation to uh, what I was doing, and I have to say my answer to that question is no. Sir Edward Lee. Uh, we've had our people's vote in Lincolnshire, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they are people, by the way. Yeah. Yes. Yes. May I express an unfashionably supportive view of the Prime Minister today? Yeah. I think, actually, that this matter is resolvable, and many of us who have been sceptical about the deal so far could be persuaded to vote for it if there was a legally, legally binding protocol saying that, as is normal with international treaties, if a temporary arrangement ceases to be temporary, then either side can unilaterally withdraw. And in any event, under international law, we would have the right to abrogate those parts of the treaty if they prove not to be temporary. So I say to the Prime Minister, keep calm and carry on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I uh, thank my right honourable friend for his, uh, for his comments and also reflect the fact that I think he has himself, um, in the amendment that he put down to the motion, reflected uh, the view that he has just expressed. And there are many ways in which we can achieve what everybody, I think, who is concerned about the backstop wants, which is to make sure that if it is used, it is only temporary. I want to try to make sure it's not used at all. Mr Barry Sherman. Is the Prime Minister aware that many people in our country feel that they were conned over the re last referendum by combination of fraudsters, cheats, foreign money yeah. and dissembling about the real truth of the challenges our country has faced? Yes. Could you also know that many of us feel it is tragic to see her so isolated, isolated from her party, from this parliament and the people in the country. Will she change her mind, as I have done, and go for a people's vote and a people's choice on the facts, not on the theory? No, I've, uh, I've already made my views clear. I mentioned it in the statement in relation to the concept of a second referendum. I think we should be delivering on the referendum that took place in 2016. Sir Hugo Swire. My right honourable friend has said she's going to be stepping up work to mitigate any disruption in the event of a no deal, and the Cabinet will be discussing that tomorrow. Given the fact that there are just over 100 days to go, we have the Christmas and the New Year break, can she inform this House and the watching country how many meetings of COBRA there will be, how many she will chair, and whether there will be meetings throughout the Christmas and New Year break of Cabinet ministers and COBRA to plan for this? Here. I say to my honourable friend, there have already been fortnightly meetings taking place. That will move to a more regular uh, rhythm uh, in, uh, in January as we continue to step up the preparations for No Deal. Okay, hey. Hey, Mr. Speaker, can I welcome the Prime Minister ruling out a second referendum when we haven't actually implemented the first? And can I also congratulate her that she didn't get her hair ruffled by President Juncker the way he seems to do to everybody? But can I just ask her, has she had a word with her Chancellor of the Exchequer, who really, when he called people who voted leave, 17.4 million people, he implied they were extremists? Have you had a word with him to make sure that he is not going to? take that attitude to decent people across the country. Nobody in this, everybody in this government recognises that people went out, this parliament gave people the decision whether or not to leave. People went out and 17.4 million people chose that we should leave the European Union. They did so for a variety of reasons. Ending free movement was for many of them, but just also for many of them, I think that concept of wanting a united kingdom able to stand independent in the world, make those trade deals around the rest of the world, um, but free of the bureaucracy of Brussels was another reason why people wanted to do that. They did that with their hearts and with their heads and with the best of intentions, and it's our job to actually deliver on the vote that they gave. 
Jacob Reese Mogg. Uh, yeah, yeah. By your leave, Mr. Speaker, may I congratulate the Prime Minister on winning the confidence of the Conservatives in this House last week? <laughs> And assure her, and assure her that she therefore commands my confidence too. Um, on the issue of the second referendum, better known as the loser's vote, yeah. I support the Prime Minister's opposition to this, not only because it is undemocratic and would be divisive, but also because it would be very hard to deny a second referendum in Scotland if we had a second referendum on membership of the European Union. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can I say, my, my honourable friend, I think, makes a good point. We have a record uh, and a, uh, over the years on a number of referendums. We have accepted the decisions that people have taken. We have not gone back to them with a second referendum. And I think he's absolutely right. And may I thank him for his remarks at the beginning of his question. Uh, Luciana Berger. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We've been told there's going to be a 34-day delay from when we were supposed to have the meaningful vote last Tuesday until the new date now on the 14th of January. There's clearly not going to be any substantive changes to the withdrawal agreement. We all know what the outcome of that vote will be, and it's irresponsible for the Prime Minister to prolong this uncertainty while not ruling out a no-deal Brexit. Further to the question from my honourable friend from Exeter, can I ask her again, what is the cost to our country of pressing the button on the no-deal contingency plans, which we know many businesses and public services across the country, including our NHS, now have to trigger before Christmas? I, well, I say to the Honourable Lady the same uh, answer that I gave to her right honourable friend, the Member for Exeter, which is that these are plans that it is sensible for government to make as contingency arrangements in the uh, circumstances that we have. If the Honourable Lady and other members of this House wish uh, to ensure that we don't leave the European Union without a deal, then the only way to do that is to support a deal. Vicky Ford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 27 Prime Ministers across Europe have agreed unanimously to offer the UK the deepest trade agreement they have ever offered. Five of those Prime Ministers are from sister parties to the British Labour Party. Seven of them are from sister parties to the British Liberal Democrat Party. Does our Prime Minister agree that the best way to avoid a hard Brexit the best way for parties opposite to avoid that is to look again at the deal that has been offered by Prime Ministers across Europe. Yes, can I, can I echo the comments of my honourable friend? I think she's absolutely right. And I understand there are those in those sister parties to parties on the opposition benches who have been talking to them and encouraging them to see that this is a deal that does deliver a far wider and more ambitious trading arrangement than has ever been offered to any other third country. Stella Creasy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. For weeks now, the Prime Minister has been clear about what her deal is. For weeks now, the European Union has been clear about what deal they will offer. For weeks now, this House has been clear about what they will reject. But it's not true that nothing has changed, because it's very clear what little support the Prime Minister had left on her own benches is ebbing away by the hour. Because when we know... Well, cheer if you want, gentlemen, but it's not happening, is it? (laughs) Because we know the quicker we take the deal, the longer we will have to prepare for whatever the outcome of that vote is. And the British public watching us go away on holiday without having made any progress on this will not forgive any of us. For goodness sake, Prime Minister, stop wasting all of our time, get on, table that vote, and let us prepare for what comes next. Can I say to the Honourable Lady, it is not correct to say that no progress has been made, but I want to see further progress being made, and that's what I'm going to be working on. James Dudridge. Mr Speaker, the draft withdrawal agreement is 585 pages long, and whilst I appreciate I don't necessarily agree with the case for not uh, producing the full plan for a managed no-deal Brexit, if the withdrawal agreement does fail in this House, how quick it will it be to that full no deal preparation being published after the withdrawal agreement is rejected. 
The, the formal position, as I'm sure my honourable friend will recall, is that if that deal is rejected, then the government has a limited period of time, number of sitting days, with which to bring forward its proposals for the uh, next stage for dealing with that situation before this, uh, before this House, and that is a timetable, obviously, which we would meet. Peter Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Of all of this lengthy statement that the Prime Minister made today, it was interesting that the one passage she leaked to the press yesterday was her antagonism towards the idea of a people's vote. It is entirely consistent with her approach to this from the start, where she took this House to the Supreme Court to stop us having a say at the beginning, withdrew the vote last week at the end. Can I just beg the Prime Minister that in the next few weeks, if she is going to pause and stop and prevaricate, can she use that time to start listening, engaging to people in this House and to the anxieties that are felt out there in the public? For the very first time, can she engage and listen? The Honourable Gentleman, I have made the point about listening to the House. That is why that further discussions are taking place. Um, but as I said in my statement, I am happy, of course, to speak with, uh, with people in this House. I have been speaking with quite a few of my colleagues over the last, uh, the last couple of weeks, and I am happy to continue to speak with colleagues about how we can ensure that we do deliver uh, for the, uh, the vote, that we deliver a, and that we deliver a good Brexit. Sir Desmond Swain. Should not her recent experiences at the Council serve as a powerful corrective to any illusion anyone could have that we could have remained members of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, my right honourable friend, I think, makes an, an interesting point, and I suspect that what he saw actually fed into the concerns that many of those 17.4 million people had when they voted to leave. This is Helen Goodman. <laughs> This afternoon, on a cross-party basis, 60 members of Parliament have written to the Prime Minister asking her to rule out no deal. She knows the costs. What possible reason can she have for not doing it now? The only way to rule out no deal is to agree a deal. Nick Herbert. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister is surely right to seek further assurances on the backstop, which, after all, is what many right honourable and honourable members on both sides of this House asked her to do. Uh, Is it not the case that most honourable members who are supporting now, having voted in most cases to trigger Article 50, but nevertheless they are supporting now a second referendum, Uh, are doing so uh, working on the heroic assumption that Remain is likely to win. Have they stopped for one second to consider the possibility that Leave might win, or worst of all, that we would have another very narrow result that would give uncertainty to this country for months and years ahead? My right hon. Friend makes a very important point about the uh, uncertainty that would come to this country. I believe a second referendum would be, uh, as I have said before, I have described it as as divisive. It would not necessarily be decisive, but I do think that uh, many people who assume that it would come with a Remain decision actually underestimate the character of the British people, whose view, I think, for many people would be, we gave a very clear message, we wanted to leave, and we'll vote even, in even greater numbers to do so. Sammy Wilson. Does the Prime Minister not realise that the reason why the EU are clinging limpet-like to this agreement is that they know they have got concessions in this agreement which will enable them when it comes to the future trade arrangements to extract even more concessions from the UK Government. And would she not be far better now to walk away with £39 billion in her pocket, her hands free, and able to do the kind of work which any government should want to do to make this country prosperous? Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman that, of course, uh, what has been made clear to the Government is that it is not the case uh, that in all circumstances, we, in, in a no deal circumstance, we would not have any financial liabilities. There would be some financial liabilities for this, uh, for this government. Of course, the £39 billion is uh, the negotiated settlement in relation to this withdrawal agreement, but there would be financial liabilities even in a no deal situation. Heidi Allen. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. 
It's actually not just the backstop that worries colleagues, myself included. For me, actually, it's the lack of legal certainty over what our future trade deals might look like. Because that political de declaration is not legally binding. So any one of the EU country leaders, including our own, should we have a different leader, could rip it up and we could be spiralling to a no-deal Brexit at any time. The Prime Minister has said it's not about our views. I actually I agree with her. And that's why she's appealed to the country directly with her deal. It's why I must represent my constituents. But if she really believes in the views of constituents being the most important thing, then surely the right thing to do, dare I say the democratic thing to do, is to be honest and grown up and display proper engagement with people. And that means checking with them that they are content with her deal. Can I say to um, my honourable friend, I think the arguments she puts about uh, listening to people can equally be put about listening to people in relation to the first uh, uh, referendum that was held on 2016. Can I also say to my honourable friend, though, that she raises an important point about the nature of the political declaration, and that concern is another issue which I have been raising with the European Union, uh, because I want to ensure that honourable and right honourable members of this House are able to have full confidence in that future trade agreement. Angus Brendan McNeil. Tharp leave, Mr. Speaker. Tharp leave. Um, she made a deal with the EU about Ireland. Is so Ireland quite right to keep her in a cage of her own making to make sure the UK cannot backslide at its commitments? Because last week the EU 27 will have noticed the sleeked way her government changed the laws, moved the goalposts when dealing with Scotland in the Supreme Court. The reality is, where once Britannia said it ruled the waves, now we see the fear is. As we have seen with Scotland, the EU's big fear is that when given the chance, Britannia will waive the rules and is away on holiday before it makes any vote on any deal. Can I say to the honourable gentleman, I think he's referring to the bill that the Scottish Parliament brought forward, which was challenging the changes that were made in relation to the Withdrawal Act. But I think that, that in relation to the relationship between the Withdrawal Act and the uh, Scottish, uh, Scottish Parliament and decisions in relation to Scotland, honour, uh, honourable members from uh, the SNP were aware, and indeed the Scottish Government was aware of the position when they brought that bill before the Scottish Parliament. Andrew Bridgen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Despite assurances from the Prime Minister that the backstop would be temporary, I remain very concerned that if this House approves the deeply flawed withdrawal agreement, we risk being trapped in the backstop inevitably. Can my right honourable friend confirm that income tax was introduced in 1799 as a temporary measure to pay for the Napoleonic Wars? <laughs> Well, I have to say to my honourable friend that um, I, I'm, uh, I'm interested in the historical, in the historical links that he, uh, that he draws on this, uh, on this matter. But I think in relation to the, uh, in relation to the backstop, it is, as I say, this is an issue that I recognise that he and others have concerns about, and I continue to work to uh, provide the assurances, which uh, I hope would be enable my honourable friend to uh, be able to accept a deal and make sure that we leave the European Union with a deal. Emma Reynolds. Speaker, several members of her cabinet this weekend have said that if her deal is voted down, then it should be for Parliament to decide what happens next. Does she agree? Yeah. There, is, uh, there is a process uh, which is set in the legislation that if the deal is voted down, uh, then it is for the government within a certain period of time to bring forward its proposals to, the, uh, to Parliament that uh, a motion will be put before Parliament and following an amendment that uh, was tabled and agreed by Parliament uh, a couple of weeks ago, that motion would be amendable. Uh, Dr Philip Lee. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Judging by the tone and content of today's statement, it would appear that the Prime Minister is still implacably opposed to what I think is the only democratic solution to this impasse. For the sake of clarity, could she confirm that she is so opposed that she would prefer a no deal? What I, what I want to see happening and what I prefer is for us to leave the European Union on the basis of a deal, on the basis of a good deal, and I believe this is a good deal. Don't break. Uh, both the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition know there is no point in kicking this can down the road. Nothing is going to happen over Christmas and the New Year. <laughs> can I ask the Prime Minister to bring forward her meaningful vote this week? Can I ask the Leader of the Opposition to bring forward his motion of no confidence this week? And then this week we can move on to where we know we are going, and that is a people's vote. 
Yeah. <laughs> Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, uh, no, the, there are further discussions continuing with the EU, EU and those will continue into the new year. Back up, pal. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I wanted to commend the, the Prime Minister's dogged determination and so many people on the streets of Taunton Dean this weekend commended, commended the Prime Minister for her attitude. And wouldn't she agree with me that, given that this is the only deal on the table, everything must be done to make it acceptable, which means everybody pulling together for the sake of the nation, but particularly for the sake of our younger generations, which don't seem to be mentioned enough. And this was reiterated to me at the University Centre of Somerset just this weekend, because we do have to leave them with an economy that is fully functioning and viable. Well, my, my honourable friend is absolutely right that we do need to ensure that we're protecting the economy for the future, and that is what this deal does. And I think the young people that she's referred to uh, at that university centre in Somerset um, would want to see an, uh, not just a government, but also an opposition that is putting their interests and the national interests first, rather than the opposition putting its party interests first. Emma Lewell back. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The last few weeks have shown this deal is going nowhere. Today's statement doesn't change that. Does the Prime Minister now regret not working cross-party to build a yeah, consensus in exactly, this House? Exactly. And why will she not accept there is a way out of this hopeless situation by extending Article 50, working together without the political posturing for a deal that works for everyone? Yeah, 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 yeah. This, is, this is about... We have negotiated a deal that works for everyone. But I would simply say to the Honourable... I would say to the Honourable Lady simply, simply this. In June 2016, a vote was held and people voted to leave the European Union. In March 2019, 29th of March, the date set for us to leave the EU, it will be nearly three years since that vote. I think people want us to get on with leaving the European Union, and that's what we'll do. Rachel McLean. Does the Prime Minister realise that when John Claude Juncker called her nebulous, he fundamentally underestimated the attitude of the British people yeah, who completely yeah, yeah, disagree yeah, yeah, yeah. with that sentiment? And that, that's what I found in my constituency of Redditch this weekend, Mr Speaker, where what people have praised is the Prime Minister's determination to get a deal that works for my constituency. Can she display that similar determination in ruling out a second referendum, which would be so insulting to my constituency? and suggest that they don't know what they voted for the first yeah, time round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think my honourable friend makes a very important point that those who, uh, many of those who advocate a second referendum uh, are you know, many people who voted to leave in the, first, in the referendum in 2016 would say exactly that. They knew what they were voting for. They voted for what they believed was right for this country and actually they want a government that delivers that. Phil Wilson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I've asked the Prime Minister before if her deal is better than the one that we have now, to which she can't give a straight answer because I think she knows the answer is no. What undermines the integrity of our democracy, Prime Minister, is to ask eventually members of this House to knowingly vote for something that will make their constituents poorer. Not those in this House who want the people to have the final say on whether they actually want that to happen in the first place. Prime Minister, is your deal better than the one we have now? And if it is, can we have the vote on the meaningful vote this week? I've, I've set out when the meaningful vote will take place. The Honourable Gentleman again referenced people being poorer under this deal than they are today. They are not going to be poorer under this deal than they are today. That is, that is, the economic analysis is very clear about this, and the economic analysis is clear that the best deal, the best approach in term that delivers on the referendum and protects jobs and the economy is the deal. James Cleverly. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, members, a number of members opposite, need some on this side of the House, have been talking about people who have changed their mind and how much it's important that we respect people's uh, uh, opportunity to change their mind. Would she agree with me that whilst there is no evidence that a meaningful number of people have changed their mind with respect to the referendum result. It is very clear a number of members opposite have changed their mind because previously they said they were going to respect the outcome Absolutely of the referendum. Right. They yeah. clearly now no longer wish to do yeah, so. Yeah. And if they want to stop Brexit, they should be honest 
with this and house and their constituents Absolutely and not. just say so. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can I say to my honourable friend, I absolutely agree with him. And it is the case that both the Conservative Party and the Labour Party campaigned in last year's election on the basis that we would respect the referendum and deliver on the referendum result. I believe that's important. I believe that that should be the position that is being taken by the opposition as well, to reflect their manifesto and to reflect the promise that they gave to the British people. Dr Lisa Cameron. Yeah, yeah. Many thanks, Mr Speaker. Given that the Conservatives have had the opportunity to decide twice in the past two years on the Prime Minister's own position, in what way is it undemocratic to give the people a second <laughs> vote point. on Brexit? Yeah. 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 Well, can I say to the Honourable Lady that, uh, the, first of all, I think it is important that we recognise when we have a referendum in this country that we uh, not, don't say to people this is a sort of, well, if it comes out with the result most people in Parliament want, then we'll accept it, and if not, we won't. Actually, we accept the results of uh, referendums in this country, and I believe, uh, given that the majority of members of this House stood last year on a manifestos to respect the result of that referendum, we should do that. Chris Blunt. Of World Trade Organisation terms from the 29th of March, not even including the opportunity for tariff free trade under Article 24 of the GATT and the immediate opportunity to negotiate and conclude free trade agreements with both the EU and the rest of the world hardly sounds like an outcome to be avoided at all costs and certainly not a disaster. The extent of any disruption of the move to the WTO terms depends on the policies of our European Union partners. If it becomes clear on Wednesday their preparations appear to make transition more difficult, not easier, will she therefore make sure that the £39 billion we would otherwise pay to the EU, the first charge is on British businesses affected by their policies, and will she show the first flash of steel by making clear she is going to at least consider the £1.2 billion of sunk costs in the Galileo project might come into that consideration? I say to uh, my right honourable friend that in the financial settlement, the work on the financial settlement that took place that has led to the 39 billion, 34 to 39 billion, which is significantly less than the 100 billion that was being talked about uh, at the European Union level at one stage, did of course take into account uh, all the aspects of the uh, United Kingdom's contributions that have been made into the European Union over over the number of years of our uh, of our membership, and it is as a result of the tough negotiations that the UK undertook, that we have seen that sum of money being significantly less than the one that the European Union initially thought of. Catherine McKinnell. On Friday, I visited the Newcastle West End Food Bank to drop off a Christmas donation. They're now distributing about 11 tonnes of food a month to people in crisis, half of whom are children. Her own government's analysis shows that we will be worse off under every Brexit scenario, but particularly if we leave without an agreement. Her no-deal threat makes no sense. She won't give the details. She won't give the economic analysis of the costs. So will she just take that threat off the table and get, give the reassurance that this government, her government, will not let the poorest in society pay for this Brexit impasse? Yes. Yeah. 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 The Honourable Lady, when, when looking at the negotiations of this deal, we wanted to ensure that we could protect jobs and that we would protect our prosperity for the future, and that's exactly what we have done. But I repeat what I have said to other Honourable Members. Uh, it, it's not possible simply to wish away a no deal without having an alternative to no deal. And that means either either having a deal or not having Brexit at all. And I believe that delivering on Brexit is what we should be doing and what this House should be agreeing. Mr Philip Davis. Speaker, can I urge the Government to get off its knees in these negotiations? And can I, will the Prime Minister remind the EU, this House and perhaps even the Cabinet, that we are the United Kingdom and, and that we are... We are perfectly capable of standing alone. We are not some kind of small third world backwater that is dependent on the benevolence of the European Union. 
The way that the EU have treated her in these negotiations is embarrassing for the Prime Minister and humiliating for the United Kingdom. Can I tell her that if she were to go along to the EU now and tell them in the face of their intransigence, she told them to get stuffed, the huge proportion of the British people would be absolutely right behind her. In this great battle between Parliament and the people, it's absolutely critical that the Prime Minister is on the side of the people. Well, can, I, can, I, can I say to my honourable friend that I believe that being on the side of the people is about ensuring that this government delivers on Brexit, and that's what we'll do. Leila Moran. Former Prime Minister David Cameron has been taken on board to sort of backseat drive this process, <coughs> given that he was the original architect of this mess. I have to say I was slightly concerned. May I ask the Prime Minister, what exactly is the former Prime Minister's role in this? When exactly was the last time she spoke to him? And what advice is he giving? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He is not giving advice. The last time I spoke to him was when we actually agreed the withdrawal agreement, when I spoke to two uh, former Prime Ministers as a matter of courtesy to indicate that, to them what had been negotiated with the European Union. Mr Robert Halfon. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I welcome the guarantees the Prime Minister has given today about having no second referendum of any kind. I also welcome her standing up to Mr Juncker. Um, could I just say in plain words uh, to uh, the Prime Minister that if she went to the European Union and said, you're, said uh, you can stick the £39 billion of taxpayers' money where the sun, to, sun don't shine unless we get move, uh, legal movement on the backstop, um, she wouldn't be called Nebula, she'd be called the Iron Lady. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I say to my honourable friend, um, <laughs> Can I simply say to my honourable friend that I think, as I've said to other members of this House, it is important for us to remember that actually there would be, whatever the circumstances of our leaving the European Union, there would be some financial obligations for us. And as a, and as a country that does meet its legal obligations, I think it would be important for us to continue to do so. Chris Bryant. Trouble it. <coughs> the time in the world isn't going to make the slightest difference to the arithmetic in this House. Absolutely. And the truth is, by delaying another 28 days from today in holding the meaningful vote, the Prime Minister is playing into the hands of the European Union. Yes. She's playing into the hands of those um, who want to undermine our security. Yeah. She's playing into the hands of those who want to be our economic rivals. Absolutely and she's achieving absolutely nothing for this country. She could invite every single member of the House round to her gaff for Christmas Day, Boxing Day and New Year's Eve, no and she's still going to lose the vote. So why doesn't she get on with it this week? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because I am seeking those further assurances to, from the European Union. I've listened to the House, and that's what I'm doing. Mr Graham. Mr Speaker, I very much hope that the Prime Minister can agree with the EU a legally binding annex to the withdrawal agreement on any intended use of the backstop, and I believe that could unite many members of this House. But given that they too, like us, were elected on a manifesto of respecting the referendum result, shouldn't any further reassurances be the moment for Labour members to join with us in supporting a practical compromise and ending uncertainty? Yeah. Look, I, I agree with my honourable friend that I think uh, it is important that when it comes to the vote that members from across this whole House put the interests of this country first, put the interests of delivering on the referendum and doing it in a way that does protect jobs and our security, which is exactly what I believe this deal does. Jim Shannon. Speaker, Prime, Prime Minister, the, uh, some of your junior ministers, those in the payroll, uh, have told other MPs that the backstop cannot be changed because if, if, they, if it was to be changed, Leo Varadkar would lose the Republic of Ireland election. We do need to have good relations with the Republic of Ireland, but Prime Minister, uh, you are the Prime Minister and know that your responsibility is for the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So can the Prime Minister remind the members of her payroll team that Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom and that there is no onus on any member or junior minister to be a cheerleader for the Taoiseach? Yeah, yeah. Can I say to my honourable friend that the reason, the reasons why we have negotiated what we have, and the reasons why we, you know, as a government, we are committed to Northern Ireland and to not having a hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, that's nothing to do with the views of the Taoiseach. It's nothing to do with the views of the government of the Republic of Ireland. It's about the commitment that we believe we should be giving to the people of Northern Ireland. 
Dr. Andrew Murison. The UK sensibly and pragmatically continues to apply the Union Customs Code after Brexit. And given from the beginning of the new year the new UK Customs Declaration System and the REC system that will replace certificates of origin, is it not the case that the European Union would not be acting in good faith if it insisted on its backstop, uh, potentially out to uh, 2099, as, as, as cited in the withdrawal agreement? Mm. Right. Uh, be very clear with my uh, hon- honourable friend that the uh, backstop is, as we have said in the withdrawal agreement and has been further confirmed by the Council conclusions last week, is intended to be temporary. Of course, Article 50 does not allow for a permanent arrangement to be put in place. But it is a c- the case, of course, that the existence of alternative arrangements which would enable us to deal with the issue of providing that there is no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland would it ensure that the backstop uh, needs not be used, and if it was used, that it could be replaced and could be replaced quickly by those arrangements. Catherine West. What advice does the Prime Minister have to my constituent who is currently stockpiling insulin, and does she believe that urgent measures need to be put in place for these vital sorts of uh, provisions? The Department, of, uh, the Department of Health, of course, them are putting uh, arrangements in place, making contingency arrangements for no deal. That is part of the preparations that are taking place, uh, which it is entirely right for the Government to do. Alberto Costa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Securing the rights of British nationals living in the EU27 and the rights of EU nationals here in the United Kingdom is a matter of the utmost importance for every member of this House. In the absence of any other alternative legal document, will the Prime Minister confirm only her deal absolutely guarantees in law the rights of our fellow Brits in the EU and EU nationals here? Yes, I'm, I'm very happy to give that uh, com- uh, confirmation to my honourable friend, and he's right to raise this as an issue. It was an issue at the early, neg- early stage of the negotiations where many members of this House raised the question of citizens' rights. Uh, now, what we hear is a lot about the backstop, but people, of course, are omitting to mention that that crucial issue of citizens' rights is reflected in and is protected, and the guarantees are given in the withdrawal agreement. Seema Malhotra. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister continues to put on this pretense that somehow when the people voted they only gave permission for her deal or for no deal. She knows that when we leave the European Union, if we leave with no deal, we will lose access to 40 plus international trade agreements covering trade with 70 countries, to EU criminal databases, to the EU single market, which over 70% of UK's exporting businesses trade with. And indeed, there could be a delay to new medicines reaching patients in the UK of two to three years. She knows that there are other legal and political options. So isn't it time for her to give herself a much better Christmas, to have a vote in the House this week on her deal, and then allow Parliament to start to work together on how we move forward? I say to the Honourable Lady that it was uh, the vote that took place in 2016 that determined that we should be leaving the European Union. I believe we should be leaving the European Union with a good deal. This is a good deal. I believe that alternatives that have been put, other alternatives that have been put forward in some cases do not deliver on the vote of the referendum and in other cases make a back, the use of a backstop even more likely. Give him faster. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister will recall last week my question was around how we ensure that the backstop is clear that cannot be forced, the UK cannot be kept in it indefinitely due to vetoes on extraneous issues. What comfort did you take from some of the comments of other European leaders, for example the Chancellor of Austria and the Prime Minister of Denmark, that this might actually be something that we can secure as a, as a United Kingdom? My friend is absolutely right. I think, crucially, a number of European Union leaders made very clear their uh, view in relation to the backstop being temporary or not being used at all, and they did uh, make clear that they were willing to listen to uh, further proposals in, in order to give greater clarification to that point. That's exactly why I think it's right that we carry on talking to the European Union on this matter. Mrs Marion Fellows. Through the subject of women's empowerment here in Parliament, 
Why doesn't the Prime Minister empower MPs here before Christmas, and why won't she empower the people with a second people's vote? Yeah, 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 yeah. Say, the Honourable Lady, I refer her to the answers I've given to those questions earlier. Yeah, yeah. When uh, President Young is not ruffling the hair of female colleagues, I think the Prime Minister got away lightly there. And we know that he follows what's said in this House very carefully. He will have heard her today saying no revocation of Article 50 and no second referendum. And I suspect he does get some sucker from some of the things that are said in this chamber. Can she now state for President Juncker the exact date when the United Kingdom will be leaving the European Union? uh, We have that date in our legislation. It's the 29th of March 2019. Dr. Rupa Hart. Speaker, the Prime Minister is not interested in the will of the people apart from one day in 2016. And with her minority government being the first ever to be found in contempt and by pulling the plug on the meaningful vote at the last minute last week, she has little regard for the sovereignty of Parliament either. Absolutely right. Given that she's returned from her latest travels empty handed due to her own red lines, why won't she allow MPs a vote on her deal this week and consider extending Article 50? It is the season of miracles and goodwill, but no one, no one at all believes this is all going to be neatly concluded by the end of March. I've answered those uh, questions uh, previously. As I've just said to my honourable friend, uh, the member for Torquay, I think it is important that we uh, follow up on the opportunity to seek these further political and legal assurances in relation to the concern that people have on the backstop. And also, as I indicated also to my uh, honourable friend, the member for South West Cambridgeshire, that uh, it is important that we look at the status of the political declaration, which is another issue which people have raised. Mrs. Anne Main. Much, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister for reminding this House that 472 members sitting now actually decided to give a people's vote in 2015? Because I suspect that if they had decided to keep the vote just to themselves that they would have voted overwhelming to remain in the European Parliament, which means that now there is inbuilt bias against delivering Brexit. So please steer course straight, Prime Minister. The country expects us to deliver Brexit. A people's vote is simply an opportunity to try and overturn the democratic vote. Well, my honourable friend is absolutely right, and that's exactly what this government is doing, steering a course to deliver on what people voted for. We gave them the uh, decision, we asked them to make that decision, they made that decision, and we should respect it. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Is the Prime Minister's plan B a no deal? Yes. Uh, What I'm working on at the moment is to ensure that we can get the assurances necessary to deal with the concerns people have on the deal that has been negotiated. Nigel Huddleston. Mr Speaker, I like to think of myself as a friendly fellow and I have no particular inclination to fall out with colleagues on either side of the chamber based on the details of the Brexit deal. The one thing I've learnt in politics, Mr Speaker, is it's perfectly reasonable to look at identical information and come to completely different conclusions. But on values, that's where I disagree. And does the Prime Minister agree that to have a second referendum would fundally, fundamentally undermine the principle of democracy? I, I, I believe there, there are many people who voted, if not for the first time at all, certainly for the first time for some considerable number of years, in that referendum. They did so in the belief that the politicians were going to listen to them, and I think their belief and their faith in politics and politicians and our democracy would be shattered if they were asked to think again. We should deliver on the vote that took place. I gapes. Mr Speaker, I listened very carefully to the words the Prime Minister used. When asked about indicative votes in this House, she said, we have no plans. When asked whether she would revoke Article 50, she said, this government will not do. If this House voted to instruct the government to revoke Article 50, would she resign and make way for another government that will carry out the wishes of this House? Is the Honourable Gentleman, if this House voted to revoke Article 50, it would be going against the wishes of the people in the referendum in 2016? Matt Warman. 
Mr Speaker, more than three quarters of my constituents voted to leave the European Union. Can the Prime Minister imagine anything more patronising than the idea that they need more democracy to have another go? And does she agree with me that their instruction was very clearly that we should be getting on with it? I absolutely agree with my hon. Friend. His constituents thought when they voted that the government were going to deliver on their vote, and that's exactly what we should do. There are hob house. Because she says that uh, a further referendum would be divisive. It is not referenda per se that are divisive. In fact, the 2016 referendum would not have been divisive if the promises made were deliverable. The, the di- a division in our country today only come from two and a half years of Brexit fantasies now hitting the wall of Brexit reality. Yeah, yeah. Brexiteers see um, uh, the Prime Minister's deal as a betrayal. And Remainers are furious because the whole Brexit argument was based on lies. Does the Prime Minister agree that in our democracy we should never be afraid of a public vote, but we should always oppose fantasies and false promises? I can assure the uh, Honourable Lady no member of this House is afraid of a public vote. Members of this House put themselves up for public votes um, uh, on a number of occasions uh, in order to uh, be elected into this House. But can I also say to the Honourable Lady, arguments were put. There were two sides of the argument in the uh, referendum. There were people, people who, people voted, people voted on their belief as to whether or not we should stay in the European Union. And I believe that we should deliver on the vote that people gave. Richard Drax. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Many here, including one or two senior members of the Cabinet, now refer to the will of MPs, which is nothing more than a fig leaf to remain. Can I ask my right honourable friend that it was the will of the majority of MPs in this place to give the people a vote? They did so. Now we must honour it, and if we fall back on WTO terms, so be it. Lead us, Prime Minister. Get this country free. Let's end this rancour. My honourable friend is absolutely right that it was the will of MPs in this House that the decision as to whether to stay in the European Union be given to the people of this country. We did that, and they voted to leave, and we should do it. The House may be interested to know that Larry the Cat at number 10 just tweeted Brexit, he said, Brexit update, giving people a vote equals breaking faith. Does the Prime Minister agree? I think I've made, I think I've made a, a, a point uh, clearly throughout this afternoon that I believe we should keep faith with the people by delivering on the vote that they gave in 2016. Will Quince. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I wanted to support this deal. I want to support this deal. I thank the Prime Minister sincerely for listening to concerns, in particular around the backstop. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that it is absolutely essential that we give her the time necessary to secure the concessions that this House wants to see? Because I guarantee the Prime Minister, if she secures them, I will stand four square behind her. I thank my honourable friend, and I thank him for pointing out that actually, having listened to the House, it's right that I'm able to have that time to, to, uh, to argue that case with the European Union and seek those further assurances that would uh, give the confidence not only to my honourable friend but to other members of this House. Eliza Dodds. Is she aware of the damage being caused to manufacturing, particularly automotive, by her failure? To rule out no deal. Yeah. Yes, the yes. manufacturing industry was uh, welcomed the fact that we had negotiated a deal, welcomed the uh, uh, trade arrangements that we had negotiated in the future partnership, and I want to be able to deliver on that for them. Yeah, yeah. Smith. Uh, Mr. Speaker, ahead of the 2016 EU membership referendum, the government spent over £9 million of taxpayers' money on a leaflet delivered to every UK home advocating that we remain, but also crucially saying that whatever the outcome of that referendum, uh, that that would be enacted. Last year, uh, 589 now elected honourable and right honourable members of this House uh, stood on an election manifesto pledges to deliver that referendum result. Will my right honourable friend confirm to this House that we will be leaving the European Union on the 29th of March next year Deal or no deal? 
I am happy to confirm that we will be leaving the European Union on the 29th of March next year, and I am grateful to my hon. Friend for having pointed out the significant number of members of this House who stood on that manifesto commitment to deliver on that vote that people took in 2016. Stephen Kinnock. The Prime Minister repeatedly claimed that the Norway Plus option would require a backstop, but on the 3rd of December, her Attorney General told me from that dispatch box that he could see no reason why Norway Plus would not satisfy the stated objectives of the backstop. Could she please confirm that she agrees with her Attorney General on that point? Honourable friend, the, the, uh, the issue is whether or not you have the customs union, with, partly about whether or not you have the customs union within the Norway Plus model. But the point is that any, the point about the uh, backstop is that it is there to deal with the period from the end of a transition period into the new relationship. Uh, the new relationship being one that will deal with the uh, guarantee to the people of Northern Ireland that there will be no hard border. Uh, in any uh, alternative arrangement, it would be necessary to have that negotiation. Norway Plus is not something that can just happen uh, just because we, uh, this House might want to say it happens. Actually, Norway Plus would require that negotiation, and therefore, uh, because we would have to negotiate to be a member of EFTA first in order to get that uh, arrangement in place, and uh, in doing that, Therefore, there would be a risk that there will be a period of time when no arrangement was in place, and that would require a backstop. Because there's, there's growing concern among my constituents at the prospect of a second vote. Indeed, growing anger. Mm. Uh, they feel that the, their vote has been stolen from them. Bearing in mind that, bearing in mind that the, the advocate, bearing in mind the advocates of a second vote talk about chaos, confusion, and uncertainty, would my right honourable friend agree with me that that would be the result of a second vote on a smaller turn? I, I agree with my honourable friend that I think I, and there is concern, and I think there should be concern about the divisive nature of a second referendum if that were to take place, and also concern that, as he has said, from his constituents and from many other people up and down the country, they trusted that the politicians were going to deliver on their vote that they, that they gave in 2016, and we have a duty to do so. Janet Davey. It is clear that the Prime Minister has refused to rule out a no deal, she has refused to extend Article 50, and she has refused to allow the option of a people's vote. Can she now tell the House her plan if her deal does not make it through Parliament? Honourable Lady, that, as I have said to a number of uh, other honourable members, if she and others want to ensure that there is not a no deal situation, then they have to either accept that the alternatives are accepting a deal or no Brexit. I believe we should be delivering on Brexit, and I believe we should be doing it with a good deal for the UK. Peter Grant. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I gently remind the Prime Minister that it is not only MPs in this place who have manifesto commitments to honour. The Scottish Government has manifesto commitments to honour, and it would be utterly undemocratic for anyone to try to stand in their way. But could the Prime Minister tell us how many people in this place stood on a manifesto that supported the chaos of a no deal? And given that the answer is none, surely that should be the first option that is taken off the table, and then we can talk about what kind of deal we can get, and if we can't get a decent deal, then not leaving should be be put back on the table. Surely giving those choices to the people is more democratic than forcing them out on a no-deal Brexit that nobody voted for. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course we can ensure that uh, we don't leave with no deal. We can do that by ensuring that we leave with a deal, and a good deal for the whole of the United Kingdom. Yeah, yeah. Jones. After two hours on her feet, we are now convinced that the Prime Minister still agrees with herself but is listening to very few other people. <laughs> Last week, no less a person than her predecessor, Sir John Major, called for an extension of Article 50, yeah. but stubbornly she still refuses to listen to any advice on this. Please, will the Prime Minister listen for once? Yeah. I, I have been listening, and that's exactly why I'm discussing with the, uh, we're having further discussions with the European Union in relation to the issue of the backstop to seek the assurances that members of this House want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Liam Byrne. The Prime Minister has said today that she's determined to frustrate another vote of the people. And she's done her level best to frustrate a vote in this Parliament. Can she understand why so many people in here think that she is trying to confront this House and bully this House with a last minute choice between her deal and no deal, even when she knows the catastrophic cost of no deal to swathes of our industry? So, can I ask the Prime Minister to clarify 
for the House this afternoon a simple fact that when it comes to a meaningful vote in January, this House will indeed be able to rule out no deal and, if necessary, extend Article 50. The motion that comes before the House will, of course, be amendable when it comes before the House in, uh, in January. Um, but I have to say to the Honourable Gentleman, this is about ensuring that we can get the assurances from the European Union, that's what we're working on, that we bring back to this House, uh, having listened to the concerns that have been raised by members of this House. Alison Thewlis. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister in her statement says that she is working on the, the tackling the spread of deliberate large-scale and systematic disinformation. Does that include um, the disinformation of vote leave and things printed on the side of buses? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the Honourable Lady, a number of things were said on both sides of the campaigns <laughs> during the referendum on the European Union. I think the task that we have before us now is not to try to relive that referendum, but actually just go on with the uh, job of delivering on it. James Frith. Talking to both sides in my constituency on Saturday, they're wondering why, since the PM knows about her own Brexit-supporting MPs' change of heart in her, why she won't now ask Berry for their conclusion on her botched deal. So I ask the Prime Minister, does she regret spending so long appeasing the 1922 instead of building a deal that works for the 48 and the 52? I have to say to the Honourable Gentleman, I think I am right in the, in the referendum his constituency actually voted to leave the European Union, and I think those people who voted to leave will want the Government to deliver on that. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I know why my constituency voted the way they did, and it was 58 to 42, but they blamed Europe for the mishaps of what we were. We lost our jobs in manufacturing as a result of going to finances away from manufacturing. 34 of the 43 local authorities are still 13 per cent behind wages from 2010, still not recovered. That's why we voted. They've seen what's been said, they've listened to what's been said, but you're not giving them a chance to vote on this offer. Now, your deal is terrible. It is not a good deal. We will be worse off. And so is a no deal. Give us a choice. We should have a choice to vote in this House today on your offer. I haven't made any offer. Well, well, that's a matter for debate, but not a matter for me. But the Prime Minister can defend her own offer, and I'm sure she will. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, can I say to the Honourable Lady that, of course, this House will have a choice. It will have a choice, when the meaningful vote is brought forward, to be able to look at whether or not it accepts the deal that is on the table and, and what it wants in, in terms of the, uh, of the future. That choice will be available, just as the choice was available to her constituents and others, mine and others, up and down the country in 2016, to decide whether or not to stay in the EU. Jack drew me. Mr Speaker, 62 members from four parties across this House have today written to the Prime Minister on the mounting concerns being expressed in our great manufacturing industries. Automotive, aerospace, shipbuilding, bus building, uh, the, the food industry. The Prime Minister, we are walking towards a cliff. We are walking towards a cliff. And if this uncertainty continues, what are already bad decisions being made for Britain will continue, and dramatically so, in the first quarter of next year. We have to have a degree of certainty without which the future for many companies and workers will be catastrophic. Why does the Prime Minister not rule out now any question of a no-deal Brexit? We have, of course, been engaging with manufacturing industry, including the automotive industry, which is very important to, uh, to this country and to jobs in this, in this country. The manufacturing industry supported and welcomed the deal when the deal was negotiated. And I say to the hon. Gentleman that he, he wants to support manufacturing industry, he wants to ensure that they have that certainty in the future, then he can support the deal. We're streeting. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister has pointedly not said that her deal is better than the one we already have. Mm. What sort of Prime Minister puts a deal to Parliament knowing it would make our country worse off than it would otherwise have been? And what sort of Prime Minister could possibly countenance the reckless chaos 
of a no deal Brexit. Absolutely Isn't right. that an insult to the office of Prime Minister? Yeah. Yeah. Gentlemen. Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, his question appeared to be based on the premise that it was possible to, uh, that we should be looking at staying inside the European Union. The people voted for us to leave the European yeah, Union. Yeah. What the economic analysis shows is that the best option in leaving the European Union that, that meets that requirement and protects jobs is the deal. Patricia Gibson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Like the Leader of the, of, of the Opposition, the Prime Minister has set herself firmly against putting this issue back to the people, clearly because she feels, as does the Leader of the Opposition, that the result this time will be different. Um, does she agree with me that for, for, both part, for both of the main parties in this House, we have come full circle then? We have ended where we have began, and that is running scared of UKIP. Yeah, yeah. Can I, can I say to the Honourable Lady, she, she suggested that I thought we shouldn't have a second referendum because I thought it might come out with a different result. Actually, no, I don't think it would come out with a different result, but, but I, I, I just believe that when we said to people in 2016, here is the choice, it, we give you that choice and we will abide by that choice, we should stick by our word. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew Slaughter. <laughs> height of irresponsibility for the Prime Minister to pretend she can win a vote on her deal when every member of this House, including her, knows that she can't, nor is there a majority for no deal. So when they are both voted down, what next? That question is fundamentally important for the future of this country, and if she can't or won't answer it, she shouldn't be in office. Mm -hmm. yeah. To the Honourable Gentleman, as we continue to work on the uh, uh, further assurances in relation to the deal, he knows full well that the vote will come before the House, the House will have its vote, and thereafter, if the deal is not supported, then the Government will bring forward its proposals for the, uh, the future steps that we will be taking. Ruth George. The Prime Minister claims to know what Leave voters voted for in 2016, but when I've surveyed thousands of my constituents, over half of Leave voters said that they wanted to stay in the single market. Almost that many said they wanted to be in the customs union. And now that they've seen the shape of the deal on the table, these are Leave voters, 16% said they'd changed their mind and wanted to remain in the European Union. So how can the Prime Minister not listen to voters? I hope that she will spend the time over the next few weeks actually listening to voters who voted and not to her own rebellious backbenchers. It is that I do listen to, uh, to voters. I speak to voters and I talk to them. And the overwhelming view that is given to me by voters is that they actually want to ensure that we get on with delivering on the vote in 2016. Yeah. Diana Johnson. Can the Prime Minister imagine any scenario whereby it would be in the national interest to extend Article 50? Can I say to the Honourable Lady, I've answered the question on extending Article 50. Uh, I believe it is important for us to deliver on the vote that people took. We have it in our legislation that we will leave the European Union on the 29th of March 2019. Yeah. Martin Whitfield. Who does the Prime Minister think will be held responsible if there's a no deal? The Executive, Parliament or the people who voted in 2016? Uh, members, of, members of this House will have a decision to take in relation to the, uh, in relation to the deal and whether they want to leave the European Union with a deal. Um, Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is economically corrosive delaying this deal. For each day that passes, our economy is sliding down and people are becoming poorer. Businesses are losing confidence. In the light of the political arithmetic, meaning that this deal will fall. What discussions did the Prime Minister have with her European counterparts this weekend about alternatives, including the extension of Article 50? Hey, to the Honourable Lady, if she is concerned and wants to give certainty to business, then she has one step that she could take which would, help, which would do that, which is to back the deal. Yeah. Dr Philippa Whitford. Mr Speaker, in light of the impact 
of the loss of EU citizens in the NHS, a 90 per cent drop in nurses coming here, and a trebling of the number of EU nurses leaving. The Prime Minister has sought in recent months to make clear to EU citizens they are welcome and they are secure. However, in her response to the member for South Leicestershire, she implied that they would only be secure if her deal passes. Can she clarify? Because she has just scared over three million people. To the honourable lady, and I know she has a a very personal interest in this issue. Uh, The withdrawal agreement sets out the agreement that has been reached between the United Kingdom and the European Union, which is in relation to EU citizens here in the UK and UK citizens in the European Union. As a government, we have been clear that we will protect the interests of European Union citizens here in the United Kingdom if there is a if there is a no deal situation. But of course, I cannot at this stage guarantee what would be the situation for UK citizens in the rest of in the European Union 27. Uh, that is a matter for those, con- those countries in the European Union to set forward. And there, the reciprocal arrangement that guarantees both sides is what is in the withdrawal agreement. Clive Efford. Mr. Speaker, it's the Prime Minister's own red lines that has brought us to the, this situation. And she's now about to squander billions of pounds worth of taxpayers' money on preparing for no deal when she knows there is no majority in this House for no deal. So that is completely unjustifiable. Now, if we need more time to negotiate, extending Article 50 is the way forward. And she is yet again putting another red line and stopping us taking the logical step of giving ourselves more time to sort out this situation. Isn't that the right way forwards? Honourable gentlemen, I have responded to a number of questions in relation to this. It, this House, of course, will have a decision to take as to whether to accept the deal that is, uh, that is on the table. Uh, you know, I'm working to get those further assurances, as I've said, but this House will have a decision as to whether to accept that deal. And if that deal is voted down, then we will have to look at the, uh, at, uh, the government will have to come forward with its proposals for the next steps. But he talks, uses this phrase that a lot of people use about red lines. Actually, what the government has been doing is respecting the vote that people gave in 2016 on issues such as bringing an end to free movement and making sure that we leave the European Union. Ms Stevens. Can the Prime Minister publish how many additional civil service jobs would be required, either with her deal or no deal? And could could we measure that against the number of civil service jobs that have been cut since the EU referendum? I am very happy to write to the Honourable Gentleman with the uh, figures for the number of civil servants who have been employed and the numbers who are continuing to be employed in terms of dealing with uh, this leaving of the European Union, because it is not, of course, we are making contingency arrangements for no deal, but there are also a lot of uh, preparations that are taking place which have involved the employment of more civil servants, which are actually about preparing for the deal. Anna McMorrin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This embarrassing, reckless Brexit we find ourselves perilously close to was begun to quell opposition within the Tory party, putting party before country. Now we have a Prime Minister putting her own interests above both party and country. When will the Prime Minister agree that with no majority for her deal, no deal or any other deal, that the only democratic way forward is to put this back to the people for a people's vote. (laughs) The party in this House that is putting party before country is the Labour Party, the front bench, who are putting the interests of trying to bring about a general election before the interests of actually getting a deal that works for this country. Deirdre Brock. 78% of my constituents in Edmund North and Leith voted to remain, and they are extremely concerned about the prospect of a no deal. So I'll repeat the question my honourable friend for Adrian Schotts asked, which the Prime Minister signally failed to answer. Will she publish her no deal planning? We are making preparations for no deal. These preparations are being stepped up. We are continuing to step up those preparations. We have already published a number of issues in relation to no deal planning through the technical notices that have been issued, uh, and we will be continuing to make sure that the information that is provided externally that is, is, necess- is that which it is necessary to ensure that people are prepared for the possibility of a no deal scenario. Nick Dakin. 
Can I thank the Prime Minister for making it very clear in her statement, in her words, that no deal risks jobs, services and security? And can I ask her to act as the leader of this great country and rule out no deal now? Yeah. Gentlemen, it is, the only way to rule out no deal is to ensure that there is a deal that enables us to leave the European Union. Wayne David. The Prime Minister has used a mantra ad nauseum. It's her deal or no deal. She's almost repeated again just now. But she, but, but she must be aware that The Economist magazine, amongst many, many others, have said that a no deal Brexit wrecks the economy. Why is she prepared to wreck the economy and will she justify that to the British people? Honourable gentlemen, I believe that the best route forward for the United Kingdom is to leave the European Union with a deal, with a good deal. I believe this is a good deal. Yes. David Linden. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Speaker. Um, one of the things that is not contained in the Prime Minister's statement um, from the Council conclusions is about the future of the single market. And she should know that leaving the single market risks 80,000 jobs in Scotland. Does she have any idea how many jobs would be lost in the Queensland, Bayless and industrial states if we lost the uh, left, left single market? Yeah. The right hon. Gentleman will be aware that within the political declaration it is clear that we will have a more ambitious trading relationship with the uh, European Union than any other third country. We will become a third country when we leave the European Union. We have negotiated that uh, deal, that future trade relationship, and that political declaration is the instructions to the negotiators for the future. We have negotiated that precisely with, uh, uh, in our minds, the need to ensure that we protect jobs, and that is what that deal will do. Karen Buck. Speaker, with three quarters of a million jobs at risk of a no deal Brexit, according to the UK Trade Observatory, 42,000 of them in my own borough of the cities of Westminster, um, is it, isn't it absolutely clear that this is the most disastrous outcome and that the Prime Minister is playing Russian roulette with people's jobs? Yeah, Given yeah. one of the very few options that can command a majority in this House is a measure to stop no deal. Isn't it the height of irresponsibility to make us wait a month for a meaningful vote, which will certainly be lost, and not to commit to taking whatever action is necessary, including suspending Article 50, to make sure we do not drive the British economy off a cliff? Yeah. Yeah. Can I say to the Honourable Lady that the, the House will have a decision to take, and it, is in, it will be in the hands of this House as to whether or not it wishes to support a deal. You can't wish no deal away. You can only ensure, if we're not going to leave with no deal, then we have to have an arrangement, we have to have a deal with which to leave the European Union. <laughs> Henry. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister talked about integrity in her statement and talked about the millions who trusted in democracy. What does she say to those same millions who have witnessed the dark money scandal, vote leave breaking the law, cash for votes, and uh, the, her government gerrymandering the Brexit committees, and a legitimate vote of the Scottish Parliament, uh, yeah. the legit legitimate bill of the Scottish Parliament being avoided, getting royal assent by her court action, yeah. or her pulling the vote on her deal halfway through the debate? Where is the integrity on those matters? Yeah, the yeah. people deserve their say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can I say to the, the honourable gentleman that uh, I believe it was the case that this issue of the uh, continuity bill in Scotland was discussed, was this matter was discussed with the government at the time. Uh, the government made clear its uh, position in relation to that continuity bill in relation to the in, in relation to this uh, matter. There were discussions with the Scottish Government throughout the Withdrawal Act going through, the EU Withdrawal Act going through this, uh, going through this House. Uh, and we have ensured at every stage that we have been consulting with, engaging with the Scottish Government and indeed with the Welsh Government on these matters. Matt Weston. Speaker. We have endured months of obfuscation and prevarication, fudge and more fudge made in Maidenhead. The Prime Minister described perfect as the enemy of the good, but she will also accept that good leadership demands the demonstration of the courage of one's convictions. Prime Minister, we are in a serious crisis. Business demands action urgently. Can I ask that it is totally irresponsible and unacceptable to delay the vote until week commencing the 7th or 14th of January? We need a vote now, and if we do not have that vote before Christmas, Please extend Article 50 because businesses demand it. 
What businesses have been clear that they want is that they want to see us leaving with a deal. They have welcomed the deal that we have negotiated, and it is therefore in members' hands to recognise that when they come to the vote. In matters. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Just so I'm clear, is she saying beyond a shadow of a doubt, in all circumstances whatsoever, that when her deal is voted down, she will not bring forward any other option other than leaving without a deal? What I have been clear about is the, uh, the decision that members of this House will have to take. If the deal is voted down, it's very clear we have the process set out in legislation which the Government will follow. Carol Monaghan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Over the weekend, we heard the news that many in the academic community were dreading that immigration rules for EU nationals would be based on salary and perceived skill levels. Can the Prime Minister please elaborate, elaborate on how categorisation of skill level will be done? And can she explain how we will continue to attract talented young researchers who earn far less than £30,000? I say to the Honourable Lady that uh, we have been clear for some time now. It was not at the weekend that we said that we were going to a skills-based immigration system. We have been clear for some months now that we are going to a skills-based uh, immigration system. The figure of 30,000 was the figure that was set out in the MAC report. Neil Coyle. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister describes a new vote on Europe as somehow an act of bad faith. This is the Prime Minister who tried to deny Parliament a meaningful vote at all, then pulled the vote when she knew she would lose. This is the Prime Minister who claims it's her way or no way, despite the option of revoking Article 50. And this is the Prime Minister who told 10,000 people from other EU countries living, working and contributing in my constituency that they had somehow jumped the queue. Is she in any position at all to lecture anyone about what it means to act in good faith on this issue? Prime Minister. I repeat to the Honourable Gentleman the points that I have made about the vote that took place in 2016 and about the duty that we have in relation to that. Hugh Gaffney. Prime Minister, I don't know what place this morning, all what place. Glasgow Parcel Force, where parcel, parcels and goods are moved about. Workers told me they were worried about this Brexit deal. Also, in my constituency, Coatbridge, Chrysler and Bells Hill, where unemployment is rising. Workers are worried about their future. Do you have a Christmas message for them, Prime Minister? Or do you want to revert back to the 2017 general election? Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman that I believe that it is right for this country to leave the European Union. That's what people voted for. I believe it's right for us to leave with a good deal. I believe we have a good deal. Parliament has expressed, uh, members of this House have expressed some concerns about a particular aspect of that, and I am working to reassure them on that particular point. And then I hope it will be possible for members of this House to uh, recognise the importance of protecting jobs and to support a good deal for leaving the EU. Daniel Zeichner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The 48% seem to count for nothing mm. anymore. Yeah. They did not vote for this descent into chaos, and many cautioned that you should not leave unless you know where you are going. So, is it not time in the national interest to revoke Article 50, not least to allow those who claim to speak for the 52% to sort out what they actually want? No. Revoking Article 50 means staying in the European Union, and it's not possible to revoke Article 50 to go back into the EU and then come back out again uh, in a few months' time. The judgment of the European Court of Justice was absolutely clear on this point. Revoking Article 50 means staying in the European Union. Martin Day. Democracy is a process, not a historical event in time, and it is essential that the public maintain faith in that process. So can the Prime Minister give me one good reason why we should respect the result of a referendum that was mired by extensive cheating and rule-breaking yeah, over yeah. having another referendum? Uh, can I say to the Honourable Minister. Gentleman, I say to the Honourable Gentleman, uh, the, the referendum took place. The government was clear at the time. Uh, Parliament was clear at the time that this was a choice for the British people. The British people chose, and I think we should deliver on that choice. Thank you. Uh, yes, a point of order, Mr. Jeremy Corbyn. Speaker, I've listened very carefully to all of the answers the Prime Minister gave during this lengthy exchange today. I've listened very carefully to what members on all sides of the House have said, and it's very clear that it is very bad unacceptable that we should be waiting almost a month before we have a meaningful vote on a crucial issue facing the future of this country. The Prime Minister has obdurately refused 
to ensure that a vote, ta vote took place on the date she agreed. She refuses to allow a vote to take place this week and is now, I assume, thinking the vote will be on the 14th of January, almost a month away. This is unacceptable in any way whatsoever. So, Mr Speaker, as the only way I can think of of ensuring a vote takes place this week, I am about to table a motion which says the following, that this House has no confidence in the Prime Minister due... Due to her failure to allow the House of Commons to have a meaningful vote straight away on the withdrawal agreement and framework for future relationships between the UK and the European Union. And that will be tabled immediately, Mr Speaker. Thank you. I thank the Leader of the Opposition for what he said. It requires no response from me, but it's on the record. And I move to the next point of order, which is from the Honourable and Learned Lady. Point of order, Joanna Cherry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In response to a couple of questions from my honourable friends, the Prime Minister has implied that Scottish National Party MPs and the Scottish Government were aware at the time the bill was brought that the UK withdrawal from the EU Legal Continuity Scotland Bill was out with the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament. I'm sure the Prime Minister has inadvertently overlooked the fact that last week the UK Supreme Court uh, passed judgment in the case, the Attorney General's reference about this case, and found in actual fact that the bill was within the competence of the Scottish Parliament when passed all save one section, section 17, and that it was only the subsequent enactment of the EU Withdrawal Act which retrospectively took powers away from the Scottish Parliament to mean that the bill was no longer within its powers. Mr Speaker, Tory members of the Scottish Parliament have been peddling misinformation about the Supreme Court judgment and there have been a number of inaccurate media reports over the last few days. I am certain that the Prime Minister would not mean to perpetuate misunderstandings about a judgment of the United Kingdom Supreme Court and I seek your guidance on how I can put the matter straight and on the record in this respect. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, let me say to the Honourable and Learned Lady that I think that she has found her own self she is aware of the device. One might almost go so far as to call it a ruse of an attempted, but in practice bogus point of order, to get across a particular point which is dear to her head and her heart. And she succeeded in that mission with admirable clarity and eloquence. The point is on the record, and it will be read in the official report. And I have a sense that the Honourable and Learned Lady will seek to spread copies of the official report far and wide in her own constituency and doubtless beyond. So far as ministers are concerned, including the Prime Minister, it is of course incumbent upon any minister who thinks he or she may inadvertently have given incorrect information to the House to correct the record. Whether in this case it is decided to do so is not a matter for me, but I hope that she feels that she has achieved her objective this afternoon. Point of order, Mr Tom Brake. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Mr Speaker, over the weekend it became very clear that the Prime Minister has some strong views on certain things, one of them being Tony Blair, which I know she shares with the Leader of the Opposition, uh, and also the merits of a people's vote, again something that she shares with the Leader of the Opposition. However, uh, Mr Speaker, however intense the Prime Minister's antipathy uh, towards a people's vote is, is it in order for her to leak chunks of her speech uh, in advance of her coming here to the House to make the statement which contains the same chunks of her speech as was leaked to the press at 10.30 last night? Well, I thank the Right Honourable Gentleman for giving me notice that he wished to raise this matter. Certainly I agree wholeheartedly and without equivocation with the proposition that announcements of government policy should be made in this House and should not be pre-announced to the media. This is not just a courtesy expected of the government, but an important principle. I think it fair only to add, in response to the Right Honourable Gentleman, however, that the government might in this case argue that the number 10 press release to which the Right Honourable Gentleman referred contained no announcement of government policy. It merely reiterated what the Prime Minister told the House last week. I do understand the sense of disquiet, even irritation, that the Right Honourable Gentleman feels.
but I think in the name of even-handedness, it is reasonable for me to put that second point on the record to, to sit alongside and to be judged against the first. Yes, of course. Uh, I will come to I'm saving him up. I don't want to squander the Honourable Gentleman too early. Point of order, Mr Frank Field. Given your record, Mr Speaker, as being a real champion of backbenchers against um, <coughs> both front benches, is there a way which those of us who want to move to a vote on what the options are open to the country if we don't support the government motion, which has been delayed by now a month, would have the opportunity of doing, expressing our views to see whether there's agreement in the House for one or more lines uh, of attack um, um, before we rise for Christmas? I indicated last week that there were two means by which the vote could be deferred. And without rehashing all of that for the Right Honourable Gentleman or others, uh, he will recall that I thought that there was a preferable way to do it and a much less preferable way to do it. Uh, the Government chose the course that it did and, as things stand, its course appears to be set. I also explained to the House, and with a view to people outside this House, that whatever the Chair might think about matters of procedure, the Chair must operate within the powers of the Chair. Manifestly, the Chair cannot act ultra vires. The clear evidence is, and the precedents all support this, that an order of the day in respect of a piece of government business can be moved only by a representative of the government, that is to say, a minister or a government whip. So I was able to express some disquiet on behalf of many members across the House at the sudden deferral of the vote, but I was not in a position to bring about the continuation of the debate or the vote upon it. When the Right Honourable Gentleman asks what recourse he has, is there any recourse he has, I suppose what I would say to the Right Honourable Gentleman is that it's always possible for members to table motions in this House. I'm not exhorting him to do so, and nor am I discouraging him from do so, doing so. The Right Honourable Gentleman is extremely experienced, and he knows that that option exists. He has a motion on the paper. He can seek to gather support for that motion, or if another motion that is judged to be pertinent to his objectives is tabled, uh, he can seek to garner support for such an approach. My role is to serve this House. I would be perfectly happy to chair debates over the Christmas period. I would be perfectly happy to come back on the 2nd of January and to sit in this chair. Millions of people are going to be working on the 2nd of January. Uh, we could do that, but it's not for me to say when the House should sit, when it should debate and when it should vote. That has to be determined by others, but I am here to serve, and if the House decided that it wanted to proceed at a different rate, at a faster pace, it would be my responsibility to be here, and I would gladly accept that responsibility. Yeah. Uh, point of order, Mr Frank. Fitt. Further to that point of order, Mr Speaker, would you be in order if one or more of the opposition parties gave their time um, uh, early in the new year so that we could re uh, reassemble and vote on the six or so options you might actually choose. Would that be in order even if the <coughs> government hadn't moved their own amendment? My sense is that for the date upon which the House sits to be changed, would very likely require a conversation. I am speaking, I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, for the avoidance of doubt, off the top of my head. It almost certainly would require a conversation and agreement between the usual channels. And if there were such an agreement, nothing is impossible. Uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman will know that there is a supply of opposition days, but the Government will normally give an indication of when there will be an opposition day, and that is usually a matter of negotiation between the two sides. It's not something on which the Speaker can rule. Uh, but I don't say that what he is suggesting is impossible, and what I am suggesting is that there seems to be some distance to travel between his aspiration and its realisation. 
Uh, point of order, Mr Angus Brendan McNeith. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, further to the point of order by my uh, learning colleague from Edinburgh South West uh, about the response the Prime Minister gave me to my question and the statement. Um, when the Prime Minister has been inadvertently overlooked the facts of the matter in the UK withdrawal from the EU Bill of the Scottish Parliament, when would a uh, convention suggest in this House that the Prime Minister be expected to correct the record as a courtesy to the House to be accurate, given particularly her office that she holds in the United Kingdom? And if an error is judged to have been made, the correction should be made with dispatch. In other words, if a member, if a member, I say to the honourable gentleman, uh, believes that he or she has erred, there should not be delay. The record should be corrected without delay.